mixing some medieval history and possible murder today, meat sex, who was the world's first serial killer? Although the concept of a serial killer didn't have a name until the FBI gave it one, the phenomenon of murder, you know, has clearly been around since, well, since we humans have been around. For as long as we meat sacks have walked the earth, I imagine we have on a regular basis killed one another. No species on earth is as good at killing as we are. Last I checked, no other species had developed bombs capable of killing hundreds of thousands of people or millions in a matter of minutes. We are at the apex of apex predators. But who was the first among us to kill one person and then another and then another and so on and not during a time of battle, not in defense of anything, but instead just because they enjoyed it? Who was the first to love murder so much they just couldn't stop or didn't want to stop? I doubt we'll ever know the real answer to that. I'm guessing it was someone who lived long before any of us learned how to write and record anything. Out of people that we do know about, historians often credit medieval France's Gilles de Ray with being the world's first serial killer, at least the first documented one, if he even was a serial killer. That classification is greatly debated. We know for sure that Gilles was a French nobleman, a brave knight and military leader, a guy who before his final trial and execution seemed to have it all for someone living in the 15th century. Money, power, a noble family, even a solid reputation for Christian piety. He was a war hero. He was good friends with and the right-hand man in battle of St. Joan of Arc. At the height of his wealth and power, he was a celebrated knight, a baron, uh, the head of France's military, whose noble court was said to be more lavish than even the king of France. How was that guy also a serial killer, a sexual defiler, torturer, murderer of children? What could have caused Jill to turn from a beloved, patriotic, pious baron into a monster, said to sacrifice children in an attempt to uh, conjure a demon who would then give him gold? According to one narrative, a new interest in the occult and a thirst to keep his lavish lifestyle afloat amid an epic spending spree is what led him down a path towards murder after murder after murder. He maybe first killed children to satisfy some dark desires, then did it thinking it would conjure demonic forces that would shower him with riches. He ended up being deemed responsible for the deaths of at least 140 children, but the number could be much higher. His sensational trial is one of the most well-documented murder trials of the Middle Ages. Jill's life and crimes were so outlandish and horrific, many think he inspired the gruesome horror fairy tale of the story of Bluebeard. Bluebeard. But again, all of this is just one narrative. Another is that he was framed by the other nobles and clergy members whom he'd mistreated or those who stood to gain wealth and power if he were taken down by heinous charges. Was Jill a murderer or a man wrongfully convicted of the worst of the worst crimes by jealous rivals? Find out this week on this medieval dark arts. History meets true crime meets conspiracy meets horror. Happy Halloween edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Well, happy Monday, Meat Sacks, and happy Halloween. Welcome or welcome back to the Cult of the Curious. I'm Dan Cummins, master of the dark arts, a husband who desperately wants his wife to just submit already to my patriarchy, a Peloponnesian war reenactor, and you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, praise be to Bojangles, glory be to Triple M, and let's fucking go. Uh, Thanks again for all the recent ratings and reviews. The best way to spread the suck outside of personal recommendations. Uh, Also, dear Space Lizard patrons, this was the first episode to come out early and ad-free on Patreon. So check your Patreon account. Over the next several weeks, we'll start getting back catalog episodes up ad-free as well and post instructions on how to add the entire catalog ad-free at once to your device and more. Uh, Apologize for not being able to roll out a smoother transition. Just just bit off uh, a bit more than I could chew this fall. Uh, I've been working every day to keep the content coming out and tend to a variety of obligations, honor existing tour dates and more soon. Going to be focused business-wise only on podcasting. Uh, In the meantime, my last tour dates for probably uh, quite some time are Chicago, November 3rd, Providence, Rhode Island, November 17th and 18th, Lexington, Kentucky, December 1st and 2nd, Virginia Beach, December 15th and 16th, then one last uh, date, Honolulu, Hawaii, January 27th. Uh, And then last thing real quick before we get into the story. Uh, check out badmagicmerch.com for a new challenge coin, a variety of awesome new merch, and more. Uh, 
and more, more new merch. <laughs> I'll, be doing, I'll be doing less announcements here. Uh, please go to the bottom of badmagicmerch.com and sign up for the email list to be notified of each new, very awesome product designed by our Art Warlock. And, and now on to a topic I've been sitting on for a while. Uh, please allow me to get medieval on your asses, you beautiful bastards. Have you ever heard the legend of Bluebeard? I don't know that I did before this week. I don't think so. I definitely knew the name. I think I thought he was a pirate. He's not. I didn't recall the story. Uh, do you know the inspiration behind the story? The story of Bluebeard is a simple fictional tale, but the real man behind it, or at least possibly, if not probably, you know, one of the men behind it, may have led a life of uh, horrific, dark secrets that belong more in a fictional horror movie, a very graphic one, than a fairy tale or historical true crime story. The Legend of Bluebeard, uh, an old children's story, old fairy tale, written by Charles Perrault for his 1697 collection of fairy tales. Uh, Legend of Bluebeard, and most of its elements, a forbidden room, a wife's curiosity, male saviors, uh, not unique. They're found in numerous old legends throughout Europe, Africa, and Asia. But unlike many of these other legends, Perrault's story most likely was derived from a real living person living in Brittany, Gilles de Ray. Perot also French. Uh, some historians do make the argument that the legend is based on Connemore the Cursed, a 6th century Breton, so another person from Brittany, a uh, chief who committed crimes similar to Bluebeard, but it seems like most are in the camp of Gilles de Ray. And of course, Perot could have taken inspiration from both. Like all fairy tales, the story of Bluebeard is pretty simple. Like most, it's also super fucking weird and a terrible story uh, to ever tell any children. And like only a select few, despite starting off fairly innocent, my God, does it get real dark. So let me, let me tell you a bedtime story, kiddos. Living in a medieval world full of constant violence, disease, famine, abuse, and oppression, not enough to fill your little heart with plenty of fucking fear? Well, maybe this will fill your precious wee head with some nightmares. Once upon a time, there was a man who owned splendid town and country houses, gold and silver plates, tapestries and coaches gilt all over. But the poor fellow had a blue beard, and this made him so ugly and frightful that there was not a woman or girl who did not run away at sight of him. Amongst his neighbors was a lady of high degree who had two surpassingly beautiful daughters. He asked for the hand of one of these in marriage, leaving it to their mother to choose which should be bestowed upon him. Both girls, however, raised objections. Another reason for their distaste was the fact that he already married several wives, and no one knew what had become of them. To convince the mother and her two daughters to marry him, he then invites them to one of his lavish country houses where he's able to show off his immense wealth. They spend eight days with him, picnicking, hunting, dancing, drinking, holding court from dusk till dawn, having elaborate feasts. By the end of their trip, the younger daughter now thinks that he was an exceedingly agreeable man. She feels as if his beard, you know, it's not really that blue after all. I mean, he's, he's actually not that ugly. I mean, no, in the right light, you know, he can be seen if you, if you squint your eyes and kind of tilt your head a bit. Very handsome. Funny how the lure of money can affect the perception of the person who possesses it. Uh, she returns to town agreeing to marry Bluebeard. And then at the end of their first month of marriage, he tells her that he has to travel far, far away for business. He's going to be gone for about six weeks. And he gives her permission to do whatever she wants. Whatever she wants while he's away, except for one thing. So almost whatever she wants, right? He just forbids this one very important thing. Here are the keys of the two large storerooms. And here is the one that locks up the gold and silver plate, which is not in everyday use. As regards this little key, it is the key of the small room at the end of the long passage on the lower floor. You may open everything. You may go everywhere. But I forbid you to enter this little room. And I forbid you so seriously that if you were indeed to open the door, I should be so angry that I might do anything. He's not kidding about the uh, do anything part. Very much a fuck around and find out tone with that one. Uh, she promises not to open the door. Bluebeard leaves for his trip. Then she immediately invites some of her friends over. You know, they're having fun. They're drinking. They're eating. But soon she grows bored of their company. She can't stop thinking about that forbidden door. It's driving her crazy. It's the apple in her Garden of Eden. She's drawn to it like Eve. So overcome with curiosity was she, that without reflecting upon the discourtesy of leaving her guests, she ran down a private staircase and so reached the door of the little room. 
There she paused for a while, thinking of the prohibition which her husband had made, and reflecting that harm might come to her as a result of disobedience. But the temptation was so great that she could not conquer it. Taking the little key with a trembling hand, she opened the door of the room. At first she saw nothing, for the windows were closed. But after a few moments she perceived dimly that the floor was entirely covered with clotted blood, and that in this were reflected the dead bodies of several women that hung along the walls. These were all the wives of Bluebeard, whose throats he had cut one after another. Pretty fucking intense for a bedtime story. She was terrified. Quickly left the room. In her hurry and fright, she dropped the key on the bloodstained floor and noticed that it was now covered with the blood of all these women. She wiped it on her clothes, scrubbed it with soap and water. Nothing could get rid of the stain. It just kept reappearing every time she wiped it off. It had stained the key with some kind of dark magic. When Bluebeard returned the next day and asked for his key, she at first handed him every key but the forbidden one. He wasn't going to be so easily fooled. He demanded to know where it was. And now she gives it to him with a trembling hand. He examines it. And of course, he sees the blood. Why is there blood on this key, he asks. I do not know at all. You do not know at all, exclaimed Bluebeard. I know well enough. You wanted to enter the little room. Well, madam, enter it you shall. You shall go and take your place among the ladies you have seen there. Now she begs him not to kill her, but Bluebeard had a heart harder than any stone, and he said coldly, You must die, madam, and at once. She accepted her fate, or at least pretended to. Asked for time to pray so her soul would be right with God before she perished, and Bluebeard allotted her 15 minutes. So, you know, he wasn't all bad. Kind of a gentleman, in moments, really. Uh, when she was left alone to pray, she called her sister to the room, asked her to check the road to see if their brothers were arriving. They were, uh, you know, said to visit her that very day uh, at any moment. At 50 minutes past, uh, she sees them approaching the distance and wants just a bit more time. But Bluebeard forces her to come down to meet her death. And... Seizing her by the hair with one hand and with the other brandishing the cutlass aloft, he made as if to cut off her head. At this very moment, there came so loud a knocking at the gate that Bluebeard stopped short. The gate was opened and two horsemen dashed in who drew their swords and rode straight at Bluebeard. The other two brothers were so close upon him that they caught him ere he could gain the first flight of steps. They plunged their swords through his body and left him dead. Yeah, and that's pretty much the story. So what exactly is the point of that story? What lessons are the kitty supposed to learn? Some historians have speculated that the fable preaches the lesson of obedience of wives, right? Submit already. Just a, just a little smidge of subservience, please. Uh, perhaps. Who is, who is it about? Well, many historians over the years have believed that the tale of Bluebeard was inspired, of course, by Gilles de Ray, The ghastly nature of his reported crimes influencing Perrault's story. Except the real tale of Jill DeRay is far more complex and much more disturbing, if true, than the legend of Bluebeard. I'm excited for you to hear it. Interesting mix of history and, well, horror. Here's how I'm tackling today's tale. Uh, first, we're going to learn a bit about the young woman who was his greatest inspiration, a woman covered fully in her own episode several years ago here on Time Suck. Uh, why do we care about her? Because Jill cared about her very, very much, and her tragic death may have caused him to unravel and turn from a beloved national hero and brave soldier into a monster who lost his faith in both God and country and really, really ran in the other direction. After meeting her, we'll cover a timeline of Gilles' life and crimes. As we look into his crimes, I think there are a few important things to keep in mind. For starters, uh, I fell getting out of bed this morning, and I think I badly damaged my penis. I woke up with a boner, boner and uh, when I fell out of my bed, uh, my fall was broken by my boner, which is kind of cool, except I think the fall broke my boner. Halfway down, it bent at a, at a right angle. It's like a, like a full 90 degrees. It's shaped like a capital L now. And when I, when I peed afterwards, I had to stand face in the shower to then shoot my pee into the toilet, which was now at my right. Is that bad? Like, do you think I should see a doctor? Or should I just accept that my life is, you know, it's going to be a bit different going forward, especially my sex life. Going to have to really figure out some new positions uh, to make it all work. Uh, sorry, that's not what I was originally going to say when I opened with for starters. No, that didn't happen. Uh, for real, for starters, just know that there are a lot of different tellings out there of Jill's story. And most of them make no mention of the fact that most of the information they're presenting might not be correct. So if you've heard this story before, it likely had some different details than my telling while still wanting to tell a captivating, gruesome tale. I also want to rely on as much historical documentation as possible. 
Otherwise, I could have saved myself a lot of time and just AI pumped out some notes. Uh, the tale of Gilda Ray is tricky to tell if you care about the truth because it's part historical documentation and part like a, like a boogeyman tale. Much of what has been written about him is based not on historical documents, but instead, uh, you know, likely embellishments added to make the story more sinister over the years. Hard to tell where the truth ends and the embellishments begin. Also making true accuracy more difficult, the uh, original trial documents could be full of lies. The confessions of those who supposedly either witnessed him torturing, raping, and murdering children, or sacrificing them to a demon, or uh, directly uh, trying to appease Satan, win his favor. These confessions were either tortured out of these people during a time when inquisitors regularly torture the shit out of people, or people giving testimony you know, to avoid being tortured. And when and where all this took place in 15th century France, you know, torturers often only stopped torturing someone when they finally confessed to whatever the torturer wanted them to confess to. And the torturers often, you know, fed the tortured the story that they wanted to hear. Now, do I know for a fact that this went on in this particular case? No, I don't know if they were fed a story. But I do know that we, you know, no longer allow confessions to be tortured out of people to be used in court for, for a good reason. If you're having your skin flayed or or being stretched until your bones start to break or you're having the bottoms of your feet burned, sharp objects jammed under your fingernails or up your ass or, you know, you're you're picked up and dropped on your boner over and over until it's bent into a 90 degree angle, Uh, you know, etc. Eventually, historical examples have proven that you'll probably confess to whatever the fuck you think the person hurting you wants you to say just to make the pain finally stop. Just to straighten out your wiener. You know what I mean? Uh, So this should make us at least question the accuracy of the confessions in this case. Also, based on the trial transcripts, uh, and DeRay was trialed twice simultaneously by both secular and ecclesiastic authorities, no hard evidence was ever found. No bodies ever recovered. Many, many witnesses did come forward saying that they saw all kinds of horrible shit, mostly at DeRay's primary castle residence, or that they saw either DeRay or, or one of his henchmen with children right before they disappeared, but no actual remains, blood, belongings of the children, etc., were ever recovered. Now, could he, dis- could if he uh, uh, or could he have? <laughs> That's the word I wanted. Uh, disposed of everything, as, as some witnesses claimed. Yeah, he could have. He was a very powerful, very wealthy man who owned a lot of castles, owned a crazy amount of land, moats, dungeons, where he could hide a bunch of bodies. But it sure seems like some evidence would have been found when you're talking about a guy who supposedly killed at least 140 children. That's a lot of fucking skeletons. Also, some of the people who had a hand in prosecuting him directly stood to gain some of his immensely valuable possessions should he be found guilty, only if he's found guilty. Talk about a serious conflict of interest, right? Would you want someone trying you in court who would be given a bunch of your shit only if you were found guilty? Hell no. No, it's fucking ridiculous. However, now looking at it from the angle of maybe he did it, DeRay openly attacked and kidnapped a clergy member. Uh, That was a public thing he did. He brazenly defined the will of the Catholic Church on numerous occasions. Dude built his own church, conducted his own masses after the Catholic Church refused to sanctify his church. That alone could have been reason to have him killed, you know, just for heresy. It's easy to find literally hundreds of examples of people being burned alive in medieval Europe simply because some royals and or church officials were offended by their actions uh, and or stood to gain something with their death, etc. Right? Burn the witch! The term witch hunt has a derogatory connotation for this very reason. The term has become synonymous for accusing someone of a bunch of bullshit so you can strip them of their power, make them a scapegoat for someone else's crimes, take their shit, etc. Gilles de Ray could have been the victim of a witch hunt, 100%. But why add all the crazy details regarding sexual torture and mutilation of a lot of kids when they didn't need to go there? That gives me pause. That is not typical. Uh, That was definitely not a common trope of witch hunts back then. You know, people refer to the Knights Templar. They were accused of some crazy stuff, you know, worshiping the demon Baphomet and having orgies and sodomizing each other. But they weren't accused of killing like fucking 100 plus kids. Again, if the church just wanted him dead, just accusing him of heresy would have been more than enough. He also breached royal protocol a number of times. The king could have him easily, uh, you know, you know, uh, trumped up uh, on other more reasonable charges. So why make the charge so dark, so over the top, if it's not true? And it was easier back then to do whatever you wanted to kids. There were no social services. Peasants had virtually no rights. Constant battles left orphans all over the place that no one was keeping track of. 
Many parents had their kids leave because they couldn't afford to feed them. You know, starvation was a fairly common thing. Uh, Kids would be killed by bandits, kidnapped by landowners, forced into indentured servitude. That kind of shit was like happening all the time. Kids disappeared constantly back then. People in general did. And just like there are plenty of sick sociopathic fucks now, I'm sure there was the same ratio of sick sociopathic fucks back then. Monsters who could take things, you know, ever further, be more brazen and kill, rape, torture, et cetera, for longer than people can do now because it was just a lot easier to get away with shit back then when there were no homicide detectives, missing person databases, forensic technology, et cetera, et cetera, especially if you're a noble, a powerful one. Okay, now that I've shared the thoughts on all this I've been sitting with, let's first reacquaint ourselves with his buddy, Joan of Arc, before jumping into the timeline today and going over his two possible lives. You know, life one, the life of a widely respected, insanely wealthy nobleman and war hero who got pretty careless with his money towards the end of his life. And life two, child rapist, murderer, and occultist. If that Jill DeRay was the real guy, this motherfucker might be the darkest serial killer, or at least equally as dark as the worst we have ever covered here. Jill DeRay admired and was heavily influenced by Joan of Arc, young French heroine whose life was tragically ended too soon. For an in-depth exploration of her, you can listen or re-listen to episode 89 of Time Suck. Uh, Joan was born in 1412, died May 30th, 1431, at the age of only 19. Sadly, she died when she when she fell out of bed and she landed on her boner and also bent it at a 90-degree angle, but couldn't pee out of it. The hose too kinked, and she died from a bladder infection. No, she was burned alive. Burn the witch! She was born in the small village of Domremy La Pucella in France. Considered a national heroine, at just 18 years old, Joan led the French army to victory against the English at the big battle of Orléans. Super unusual for a woman to fight in battle at this time, by the way. Not normal. Like, completely unheard of, really. She was only allowed to fight because there was this rumor floating around the French countryside of a prophecy from a fucking wizard. This is back when people believed in a lot of wizards. uh, Where a female virgin was to come forth and save France from English aggressors. France was desperate and losing a lot of territory to England and their allies, some of whom were French noblemen. And then when she helped lead France, you know, uh, to victory in some very decisive battles, she was seen as France's prophesied virginal savior. But then she was captured by the enemy, burned at the stake as a heretic. Centuries later, May 16th, 1920, uh, Joan was canonized as a Roman Catholic saint. They really fucking took their time on that one. Um, When Joan was uh, was born, uh, France and England were in the thick of the Hundred Years' War. This war began out of a dispute over who was the true dauphin, rightful heir to the French throne. The Hundred Years' War lasted from 1337 to 1453. So for more than 100 years, the 116 Years' War, just not as catchy of a title, I guess, wasn't actually continually fought for over 100 uh, years, but rather intermittent periods of war spaced out over more than 100 years. Like most medieval wars, it was fought largely over land disputes and royal titles. There were two main causes. The first was the status of the Duchy of Guienne along France's western coast around the city of Bordeaux, or where that is now. It kind of belonged to England, but also was still a fife for the French. It was a little confusing. Q land dispute chaos. The French king, Philip VI, confiscated the Duchy of Guienne from the English May 24, 1337, but the English still wanted independent possession of the territory and were willing to fight for it. They wanted a foothold in continental Europe. Second cause was the kings of England, the closest relatives of the last direct Capetian king, Charles IV, uh, who died in 1328, now also claimed the crown of France in 1337. So cue some Game of Thrones shit. Bunch of intermarriage between various European royals typically designed to help avoid conflict, sometimes ironically would lead directly to the conflict when a monarch would die with no direct male heir to the throne. Now you have a variety of blood relations all making claims that they are the rightful king. And sometimes these motherfuckers are already kings of another nation, a nation that doesn't get along very well and is often at war with the nation having the succession crisis. And that can lead to decades of warfare. In the 1300s, uh, France had the most financial and military military resources of anywhere in Western Europe. England was smaller and less populated, but they had a better army. They weren't fucking around with these deadly longbows they had. Their soldiers were well-disciplined, more skilled with them, and their longbow archers were able to stop cavalry charges and defeat French armies in battle due to owning a, a much superior fighting range. France really fucked up when they failed to really embrace this weapon and make it a primary piece of their battle arsenal. Their nobles were... Uh, too worried about the peasants 
getting too good with these weapons and then turning against them. Hard to consistently win in battle against an enemy that can kill your troops from up to a thousand feet away, you know, and several hundred feet accurately when your troops are leaning more on things like crossbows. They can only shoot effectively about 40 yards, you know, 120 feet. In one battle, the English were letting loose an estimated 1,000 arrows from their longbows a second at the height of the conflict, truly just fucking raining terror down upon the French. And they just had to fucking take it because they couldn't strike back from the same distance. In 1360, after losing a series of major battles due to shit like this, King John of France forced to accept the Treaty of Calais to remain on the throne. This treaty granted true independence to the Duchy of Guienne, which ended up enlarging through some more skirmishes and negotiations to the point of becoming a third of the size of modern France. But then the French turned things around. They did what Russia would become infam infamous for doing uh, much, much later, and they just started throwing a lot more bodies into battles than the, uh, their opponents could. By 1380, John's son, uh, King Charles V, had reconquered most of the territory France lost from previous sieges, and then the fighting took a hiatus for most, uh, you know, for the most part, for a while until British monarch Henry V renewed the war in 1415. Some rulers much more into this fight than others. Uh, Henry V, very much into it. He was a true warrior king. Had a lot of, uh, let's fucking go in him. That year, King Henry invaded northern France, defeated the French armies, gained the support of the Burgundians of France, these nobles. Henry had alliances with Philip the Good, the Duke of Burgundy, and his soldiers occupied most of northern France where Joan grew up. And many French peasants, like Joan, well, they didn't like being ruled by a man aligned with the English crown. Henry V kicked so much French ass, he beat the French into signing a treaty of submission. Submit, you motherfuckers! It puts the lotion on its skin or it gets the arrows again. They signed the 1420 Treaty of Troyes. This treaty granted the French throne to soon fall to Henry V, who would then rule both sides of the English Channel. He became a regent, for King Charles VI was set to inherit the throne after his death. A lot of Charleses, a lot of Chucks. Uh, King Charles, nearly 20 years older, it was thought that he would die well before Henry, but then that doesn't happen. 1422, Henry and Charles both die within months of each other, and Henry dies before Charles. Henry's baby son, not even one year old, is named the new Dauphin after his death, but French supporters of Charles uh, the Seventh, Charles the Sixth's son, well, they want him on the throne instead of an English baby king. They're not going to be ruled by a fucking baby! Like a literal baby! The shit's too much! War's back on. Uh, jo Joan spent her childhood surrounded by this shit. She's 10 when this happens. She grew up as a peasant. Her father, Jacques, was a tenant farmer, and Joan, like all women of that time and place, had no formal military training. Uh, but then Joan first started having what she believed to be visions at the age of 13. So, she might have been, uh, might have been a little bit cray-cray. Uh, she started to think it was her destiny to save France from British rule. And some of her visions, St. Michael, St. Catherine, and St. Margaret, all told her that she was the savior of France and encouraged her to seek an audience with Charles VII, who would assume the title of Dauphin from his French supporters. Right? She's, she totally believes this. Uh, she wants Charles's blessing to lead France, to defeat the English, and put him on the throne. At the age of 16, Joan is uh, able to talk to a local court, uh, talk uh, them uh, letting her out of an arranged marriage so she can complete her mission. This is very unorthodox. 1428, Jones's visions instruct her now to go to Vaucouleur and contact uh, Robert de Baudricourt, garrison commander and supporter of Charles. He initially refuses her request. You know, he probably thinks she's fucking out of her mind and he sends her away. But she comes back and soon the, the villagers admire her for her determination, for her piety. She's very religious. After seeing how the villagers uh, respect her in January of 1429, he does give her a horse and a group of a few soldiers to make her journey to the royal court. February 13th, 1429, Joan cuts her hair, dresses as a man for her 11-day journey to she knew the location of Charles's court at this time. Joan comes to Charles, tells him that she is the savior of France. And he, you know, probably also thought she's fucking bonkers. I mean, at least at first, right? Or maybe not. You know, people were much more superstitious back then overall than now. Uh, Joan was extremely charismatic, dedicated to France and the Catholic Church, very persuasive. Uh, she would go on to pass all kinds of tests they gave her. Clergy members would test her faith, find her to be very devoted to both the church and King Charles. Uh, also determined by, you know, some, uh, some, some ladies to be a, a virgin. So she could fulfill the virginal prophecy. And she begins calling herself Joan the Maiden. On top of all that, she proves herself to be a good soldier and military leader which is a little modicum of, of training. She wins Charles over when she identifies him while he is in disguise, dressed as a me regular member of the court. 
and she reveals details of a private prayer he had made to God. I mean, revealing details of a private prayer he had. Pretty impressive little trick. Uh, Joan promises to take the important uh, French city of Rheims for Charles, and she asks for an army to fight at Orléans. She was given it. Charles sends her off with custom armor and a fucking new horse. March of 1429, March 22nd of that year, Joan dictates a letter of defiance to the English before she launches her attack upon them. She might regret this a bit later. Uh, Joan, now only 17 and her new armor and war horse, is allowed to travel with the army to Orléans in April. In a series of battles between May 4th and 7th, uh, she is injured. She takes an arrow right between her neck and shoulder. Damn you, longboats! But still returns to the front lines of the final battle. And she leads the army to victory at Orléans. You know, fucking huge victory for France. Then in mid-June, uh, or mid-June, Joan encourages Charles to keep fighting, to go to Rems, to be crowned king. And he is crowned July 17th, 1429. And she is at his side during the ceremony. After the coronation, Joan encourages Charles to try to take Paris. He's not eager to quite do that yet. He's like, ah, maybe we should wait. Now his favorite court member, uh, Georges de la Tremouille, jealous Georgie Georgie Puddin' Pie, warns Charles that Joan, ah, she's power hungry. Keep an eye on her. It's a fucking weasel. A lot of weasels in the courts of medieval kings. Or maybe she was really scheming. I don't know. I, w- I wasn't there. Uh, Joan then leads in an unsuccessful attack on Paris in September of 1429. She survives, though, to fight again. In the spring of 1430, Charles now orders Joan to uh, Compiègne. To confront the Burgundian assaults, those French traitor noble fucks. When Joan tries to defend the town and its residents, she's thrown off her horse, and then she's left outside the gates as they close. Closed by more cowards. Joan now captured, held hostage by the Burgundians for several months, and then they hand her over to the English for 10,000 francs. Now she's probably regretting, you know, writing them that letter telling them that they're going to be destroyed. Then Charles, her sweet, sweet Chuck who she fought so bravely for. He makes zero fucking attempts to have her released. Most likely because of heresy charges now leveled against her. Didn't want to piss off the Pope. Just hung her out to dry. And what were the main bases, or what was the main basis for the heresy charges against Joan? Well, that a woman could only be so dominant in battle if she was being given supernatural powers from the devil. Uh, when she was fighting, uh, you know, for Charles, her powers were seen as a gift from God. And now those same powers linked to the devil by those she fought against. And Charles's coward ass does nothing to help the person most responsible for helping him get his crown. Her English captors now turn her over to the church. Joan is charged with 70 crimes, including witchcraft, heresy, and maybe most importantly, dressing like a man. Those corrupt, wishy-washy motherfuckers. The same church she had been fighting for now condemns her. The French loyalist priests and other clergy members celebrated her victories. Well, now English loyalist church officials all too happy to burn her alive. It's a sick little game they're playing. Uh, Any any real notion of God not factoring into any of this. Uh, Between February 21st and March 24th, 1431, Joan interrogated a dozen times by an ecclesiastical tribunal. She consistently professes her innocence. She's held in a military prison under constant threat of rape and torture. And the tribunal is furious. They just can't get her to confess. To the charges. May of 1431, Joan finally does sign a confession, denying that she believed she had ever received divine guidance. A few days later, she's charged with dressing in men's clothes and is given a fucking death sentence. What a bunch of cruel bastards. May 29th, 1431, Joan found guilty of heresy. May 30th, taken to the marketplace in Rouen, burned at the stake in front of around 10,000 people, burned alive in front of thousands of spectators. What a crazy end to one's days on earth. The Hundred Years' War she fought so bravely and will continue to go on for another 22 years and the French crown will ultimately emerge victorious. Paris will be liberated by 1441. Charles' forces will recapture the Duchy of Normandy in 1450 and the Duchy of Guienne in 1453. There is no formal peace treaty signed at that time, but that, you know, marks the end of the war for all intents and purposes. The English finally accepted the French just too strong to defeat. They got too many soldiers despite their longbows. Uh, Charles will order an investigation in 1456 and clear Joan of all the charges against her. That's so great. How fucking nice, Chuck. What a wonderful, hollow gesture. I'm sure she looked down from heaven and gave your pathetic ashes a big old thumbs up, big old grin. Too little, about 25 years too late. Chuck the cuck. Joan was only 19 when she died, but she clearly left a lasting impact on the world. Also made a huge impact on Gilles de Ray. Jill fought by Joan's side at the, at the height of, you know, like her most important battles. He was her right-hand man in her biggest skirmishes. 
and we will learn more about their connection in the timeline. He felt rightly that King Charles had betrayed her by not fighting to rescue her, uh, or at least demanding that the Pope, you know, intervene on her behalf. He felt like the church also betrayed her, which they definitely did. Previous to her execution, Jill uh, seemed to be driven primarily by loyalist feelings towards both the French crown and the Catholic church. Right, and now he loses a tremendous amount of faith in the two most important institutions in his life, the ones that matter the most to him. And some think that all of this caused him to spiral into madness. Or, you know, he'd been looking for an excuse to uh, do horrible shit to little boys for a long time. Who knows? I'm just sharing the historical speculation. Let's learn about Gilles now and try to determine who this dude was. Try to determine if he, if he seemed capable of the insanely heinous crimes he was accused of. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Gilles Duray, born in September or October of 1404, exact date not known. He was born at Chamtosis, Loire, one of his family's many castles. Uh, how cool to be born into a family with many castles. I, I would have taken just one castle as a kid. I'd have been pretty pumped for one castle. Imagine how cool it would be to grow up in a castle now. <laughs> if it was med- like a medieval castle uh, furnished with like modern amenities, AC, plasma, flat screen TVs, Wi-Fi, hot showers and stuff. Mom, can I go to a sleepover at Danny's house? I want to spend the night in the Cummins Castle. You never have a problem getting friends as a kid if you live in a fucking castle. Letting your buddies ride their bikes right across your drawbridge. You fucking kidding me? Maybe do a little fishing in the moat. Head up to the top of a turret. Throw some apples at the neighbor's house or something. That is a, that is a top shelf childhood. Uh, Gilles was born with the title of Baron and all the wealth that would come with such a title. Also very cool. Having a title as a kid. That's pretty sick. Please do not push me again when it is my rightful turn to go down the slide. I am a baron. And once I come of age and am given my full powers, I will most certainly have you killed peasant. It'd be so fun to call people peasants. <laughs> and have that like really mean something, you know, like have them be afraid. Silence, peasant! <sighs> and then you fucking cower. Uh, his birth name was uh, Gilles de, uh, Gilles de Montsilevel. Uh, Baron de Ray. Later, he became known as Gilles de Ray. So many fucking names when it comes to French nobles because their you know, various names reflect their different possessions and titles. Uh, Gilles' original name reflected the fact that he was born a member of the House of Montmorency, uh, one of the oldest, most respected, distinguished noble families in France, and also born a member of the House of Lavelle, two important, powerful, old, wealthy noble families who owned lots of estates, tons of castles, had a lot of political sway Western Europe, uh, Western France. And he, uh, his name later became Gilles de Ray because he inherited the title of Baron of a Western historical region of France known as uh, Pays uh, du Ritz, part of Brittany. And the Ray's, uh, you know, the du Ray attests to that. Gilles born in the Brittany region of France. Numerous members of French nobility attended his baptism, honoring a male child born to immense wealth and influence. Going to get into some of his uh, lineage for a bit here and throw a lot of French words at you now. So many pronunciations uh, went over for this one. At first, I thought about scrapping this section, a word that was just boring. But I think it's important to understand how interwoven and scheming all of these nobles are. Right? If Gilles was framed for his crime so others could take his possessions, this helps illustrate how that would align with, uh, you know, all the Game of Thrones style continual fighting and backstabbing when it came to acquiring wealth and titles that was going on where and when he was alive. Titles were very important, right? People would often did kill for them. Or frame others, standing in between them and the desired title, right? To be rid of that person. Uh, These titles typically came with immense land ownership and also governmental powers. They were hereditary. They would would change the course of your, you know, future family fortune, sometimes dramatically. The most important title was, of course, the king, the sovereign. And then the rest flowed downward in a hierarchy from there. If you aspired to marry a king or a queen, uh, give birth to one if you weren't the sovereign already, you needed a powerful title to be in the running. You needed a lot of money to have a shot at that. If you didn't have a title uh, and you wanted one, you needed a lot of money and land to be appealing to a noble family for marriage. You would give them money. They give you prestige, power, land, access to more money in the future. In general, noble marriages were almost always between nobles. So one family wasn't giving up more than they were getting. So ideally, uh, the wealth and influence of both houses, you know, would grow. Furthermore, since, you know, as opposed to getting a spread too thin. 
Furthermore, since nobles would help fund and lead the military, marriage bonds would strengthen your family against enemy invaders. You're making alliances to help ensure that you and your family can keep your land, wealth, power, prestige. Okay, let's look at uh, Gilles de Ray's noble lineage now. Gilles' father was Guy II uh, de Montmorency Lavelle. Guy was a knight, a lord of Blaison and uh, Chemier, aka a rich, powerful, important motherfucker. Gilles' mother was Marie Ducron, direct descendant of King Robert II of France, aka Robert the Pious or Robert the Wise, who lived from 972 to 1031. King Robert restored the Roman custom of burning heretics at the stake, so he was super fun. He was a cool guy. Uh, for a time in ancient Rome, burning at the stake, a common method of capital punishment. Uh, they had a whole system. The victim would be dressed in a tunic, smeared with tar, soaked in grease by the executioner. This would cause the victim to be sent up in flames almost immediately. And they would light them, you know, from their feet, burn from the bottom up, so it lasted a little longer, causing extreme physical pain. You ever heard of Roman candle fireworks? They're banned now in 11 states and numerous countries. Little, little tubes you, little, uh, you hold in your hand. You light the top of the tube and then numerous exploding shells, sometimes called stars, you know, shoot out typically with around a, a second's worth of delay in between each launch. Not a big firework guy, but uh, yeah, they're pretty cool. Well, the name of this firework comes from the ancient Roman practice popularized by Emperor Nero that I just described, but at night. Burning people alive at the stake, lots of people at night to help illuminate some Roman festivities. Right? They're having a big festival. Let's get, some, let's get some fucking lights. Let's light some people on fire so we can see what's going on. They would use people as literal human fucking candles. Roman candles. That shit is savage. The Romans, man. I don't, I don't think anyone has ever been more creative or, or callous when it comes to torture or executions. Some medieval, uh, you know, uh, Royal houses, you know, gave them a run for their money, but the Romans overall, whew. Uh, Roman candle, also a great early Elliot Smith, uh, Elliot Smith song. If you're feeling too happy and you'd like to take your mood down a few pegs, uh, Elliot Smith, maybe the best soundtrack for feeling melancholy. Uh, ironically, King Robert II would legalize the exact type of punishment that his great, 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 etc. grandson, Gilles, would later be sentenced to receive. Gilles' mother, Marie, also related to the houses of Machcou and Ray, powerful noble French families. This dude had quite the bloodline, quite the pedigree. Uh, Guy's marriage to Marie was political, of course. Noble marriages, as I mentioned, almost always political. 1371, the last Baron of Ray, uh, Chabot V, died with no male heir. Passed his property down to his sister, Jeanne, nicknamed Jeanne La Sage, Jeanne the Sensible. And she sounds boring as shit. Good head on her shoulders, shrewd. Maybe not real fun. Jeanne had no children. Too sensible for that. And was looking for a successor to her fortune. She chose her younger cousin, Guy II de uh, Montmorency Lavelle, but there was a problem with this. Guy's grandmother, Jeanne La Foule, literally Jeanne the Crazy, <laughs> had been disinherited after she married for love. Now that Jen sounds fun. Fucking Hail Lucifina. Maybe this means that I'm also crazy, but I feel like if I had to pick which woman to date without getting to see him first or hear any details about them other than their name, I'm going to roll the dice on Jen the Crazy. Could backfire. Could also be fucking epic time. Anyway, uh, this decree blocked Jen the Crazy's descendants from ever inheriting the Baron de Ray big scandal. And Guy II de Montmorency Lavelle was a descendant. Jeanne the Sensible had previously offered to adopt Guy, legally include him in her family line. The only condition was that Guy had to renounce his title and arms of Lavelle and assume the title of the House of Ray. September 24th, 1401, he does do this. He's officially adopted by his aunt. But then a short time later, Jeanne, Guy, big argument, big falling out. May 14th, 1402, she cancels the contract, chooses Catherine de Machcoul. Uh, her distant cousin, and of course, another member of a noble castle-owning family to be her new heir. Madame de Machcou uh, was a widow with one son, Jean de uh, Jean Ducron. Jean was now set to become Baron de Ray. But not so fast! Guy brought forth a lawsuit before the Paris Parliament. After a protracted legal battle, the two sides reach an agreement, a compromise. Guy will marry Jean's daughter Marie, and he will inherit the barony of Ray. They marry on February 5th, 1404, their first child, G, born that same year, 
Three years later, in 1407, Jean the Sensible dies. Guy now inherits the barony. Now he is Gilderé. He's inherited a solid title. One his dad really had to battle for. Uh, not much is known about Gilles' early childhood, but he certainly lived the luxurious lifestyle of noble babies. Fine clothing, plenty of food, access to great education, uh, numerous servants doting on him, making sure that he never wants for anything important. A far better life than any non-noble babies. He likely even had a, a bedroom, a nursery attendant who would keep watch over him at night to make sure that he never fell out of bed and landed on his boner, permanently bending it very far to the right, making it very tricky to pee or something like that. Uh, historians looking into the serial killer angle have looked for signs of abuse from his childhood, either of him being abused or him abusing others, you know, fucking spit roasting the family dog, something, but not been able to find anything, which doesn't really indicate whether or not it happened even if he was abused and abused horrifically or if he abused others terribly, uh, it would be shocking to find a a written record attesting to that. People just did not write about shit like that back then. Not ever, to my knowledge. The earliest written record I can find of someone specifically addressing parental uh, child abuse comes from France in the late 16th century, so much later, and even then talks about it in general terms as as opposed to naming a, a specific victim or abuser. I imagine... Much more abuse occurred occurred back then than it does now. Physical, emotional, sexual, all of it. And it was just kept hidden, right? How terrible. I mean, if thousands of priests clearly can get away with abusing children of the faithful in recent years and not trying to pick on them, like, you know, and many other people get away with it constantly, fucking neighbors, random dads, whatever. Abuse must have been, uh, you know, far more common in medieval Europe when the clergy, far more powerful than it is now when, you know, uh, parents had more power over their kids than they than they do now you know it's much much easier to get away with shit when nobles had so much power you could be excommunicated uh you know uh receive punishment for being a heretic just over accusations so much power so much easier to hide shit back then parents now have to worry about social services taking their kids if they abuse them teachers and others are looking for signs of abuse so they can report parents back then no such agencies existed and harsh physical abuse was the norm, right? You fucking grab a stick, take it to your kid, you fucking beat him all day long. No one's going to say shit to anybody. Uh, incest in general thought to have been way more common. Who would victims report it to? Right? Their priests? Uh, you know, nobles? They didn't fucking give a shit. You know, what was anybody going to do to stop it? If the abuser was a rich and powerful noble, you know, who ties regularly, no one's stopping it. Yet again, uh, this all illustrates that despite all of our current problems, what a time to be alive! So much better now. Uh, Due to a lack of documentation of family life, if Gilles was a uh, prolific serial killer and sexual sadist, we do not know what triggered his dark compulsions. We don't know if he himself was abused or witnessed abused or, you know, was torturing, killing palace pets or anything. Maybe he had some brutal frontal lobe injury in battle that, you know, changed his trajectory, sent him down a dark path after irrevocably corrupting his moral compass. No idea. What we do know is that Gilles had it all. Money, power, prestige. Also described as being very handsome. Dark hair, pale skin, pale in a way that was revered back then. Uh, Said to be well-mannered and charismatic. We know that he was the oldest son. Uh, Customs of the day dictated that he would thus become a knight. That in order to to prepare for that, he would begin military training at a young age. Probably uh, before his early teens. Uh, We also know Gilles was educated. At a young age, he would have already been taught uh, to be fluent in Latin. He would know all about Greek and Roman history and so much more. He had only one sibling, a younger brother, Rene, born in 1407. Unfortunately for Rene, he would, uh, like a lot of younger siblings back then, grow up in the shadow of his older brother. Uh, Being firstborn, specifically being a firstborn son, uh, meant way more back then than it does now. October 25th, 1414, Grandpa Jean de uh, de Ducrons, son Omari, killed at the Battle of Agincourt, an English victory during the same Hundred Years' War that Gilles would later fight in. Uh, Gilles, at the age of around nine, now set to inherit the Ducron estate and the Ray estate. Pretty cool thing to find out when you're nine years old. That two massive estates and a big old pile of money is waiting for you as soon as you become an adult. A year later, September 28th, 1415, uh, Guy du Lavelle killed in a hunting accident. Some sources say that Gilles witnessed his father's death and that it was exceptionally violent. But the veracity of these claims is debated. No historical record of that. Just people writing about Gilles years after his death, adding details here and there to his story 
to make their own stories, you know, more entertaining about him. Shortly after his dad died, Gilles' mother, Marie Ducron, she dies as well. Uh, We do have some details about that. Her head fell off. Super duper rare cause of death. Hasn't happened in centuries. But there used to be some kind of parasite back before modern medicine eradicated it. It would burrow hundreds of little tunnels inside your neck, secreted some kind of enzyme that would numb your nerve endings. So you wouldn't feel pain. You wouldn't even know it was happening. These parasites would just keep tunneling and tunneling and tunneling, eating up both muscle tissue and hollowing out some of your neck vertebrae, but never destroying arteries and veins of your spine or, or your spinal column. So your body, you know, would keep functioning while the structural integrity of your neck would steadily degrade to the point that eventually, after months of feeling increasing levels of weakness and soreness, some headaches, you would turn to look at something real quick or, or you'd get out of bed too fast and your head would fall the fuck off. They called it God's guillotine. What happened to Marie? God's guillotine. One day she seemed fine. Next day she lost her head. And of course, that is complete fucking nonsense. But dear God, I hope at least one of you bought it. You fucking idiot. <laughs> JK. No, she died of unknown causes. Could have been cancer. Could have been a heart attack. Stroke, liver disease. Could have fallen out of her you know, bed on, on her boner. I, I don't know. You know, They didn't know what was going on with people's bodies back then. Jill and Renee now became orphans when Jill was around age 11. Jill now gains access to his father's large estates, tremendous wealth, limited access though, right? Not quite ready to run shit. A little bit young, gotta be mentored. And his uh, grandfather will do that. After his parents die, Jill and his brother are raised by his maternal grandfather, uh, Jean uh, Ducron. Ducron made Jill's education primarily focused on military strategy. Because of that ongoing hundred years war, military training, huge part of the education of most noblemen. They needed to know how to fight, how to lead soldiers in battle. Ducron's lessons focus primarily on learning how to protect property and defend an estate. And his lessons may have been delivered with more than a, a touch of asshole. Jean has been described in numerous sources as being a disreputable character, allegedly prone to anger, violence, even accused of murder. When he was in the military, Jean pillaged, killed, assaulted, captured others' inheritances, uh, supposedly boasted about kidnapping women and men, humiliating, torturing them. Maybe, again, impossible to verify any of this. Numerous academic sources I've come across state that these depictions do not come from his contemporaries. So these salacious details, you know, they might be made up to make the stories more titillating or they might be true. Maybe he was a rude boy, a vicious bastard. Uh, Gilles did say later at his trial that he was badly governed by his grandfather, meaning he didn't have much guidance as a child. Noblemen in general at this time, uh, yeah, they did have a violent education, violent education for violent times. Who knows how this affected the psyche of Gilles and many others. A lot of his education was centered on combat games and physical training. Boys started wearing armor from a young age. Gilda had lessons focused on swordplay, archery, jousting, and more, you know, military strategy. A number of new weapons showed up in the Hundred Years' War, such as gunpowder-fueled firearms and cannons, but the sword, uh, you know, still the primary method of human destruction when Gilda fought. Sword and, and the arrow. Uh, according to Gilles' later testimony at court, Jean overly indulgent let him and Rene both get away with outrageous behavior. Gilles got whatever he wanted growing up whenever he wanted, uh, which would have, you know, possibly left him impatient and indifferent to others' feelings, a little sociopathic, perhaps. 1417, when Gilles is about 12, Jean makes his first attempt at arranging a marriage for his grandson. That's just how it worked back then. Got to uh, set things up early, make sure uh, all the political alliances arranged just so. Initially, he wants Gilles to be betrothed to a four-year-old, Jeanne Pinel, uh, one of the wealthiest heiresses in Normandy. They're betrothed January of 1417, but then she sadly dies before the wedding. Uh, To be clear, she was not going to be married at the age of four. No, they had the decency back then to wait until girls were 12. So, you know, grown women, basically. (laughs) JK, again. It's fucking crazy to think about a 12-year-old bride. Also super weird to be four and already uh, know who your husband's going to be. Two years later, November of 1419, Jean makes another attempt to marry Gilles, now 14 the age at which boys could marry then, uh, to Beatrice de Rohan, niece of the Duke of Brittany, who was, uh, when they were, you know, arranged in marriage, uh, she was three years old, but like a mature, a mature three, very physically developed three. Also designed, <laughs> I don't know how old she was. Uh, she died after signing the marriage contract. Um, so she's probably a little older than that. Uh, sources don't say. 1420, when he's around 16, Gilles goes to battle. Also crazy to think about, so young. And battles back then, so much more up close and personal than they often are now, right? Taking a sword to someone's neck at the age of just, uh, you know, 16, 15, 16. 
Uh, Gilles was apparently a solid knight. He first uh, earned his reputation as a good soldier when he rescued the Duke of Brittany from kidnappers. The Duke had been kidnapped thanks to leftover hostilities from the Breton War of Succession. This happened uh, the previous century. From 1341 to 1364, there was a struggle between the uh, Montforts of Brittany and the Counts of Blois over control of the Duchy of Brittany. The Montforts kept their territory, but the Blois continued to plot against them for almost a full century, holding on to a grudge for a long time. Finally, February 1420, Olivier de Blois, uh, Count of uh, Pontueva, kidnaps Jean V, Duke of Brittany. Jean de Cron, young Gilles, go to war for the Duke in the House of Montfort. In response, the Count sends some mercenaries into uh, de Cron and Ray territories. Gilles fights back with a fierceness that belies his youth. He's good in battle, talented soldier, loved combat. He and his grandfather are able to get Jean V released. So many fucking Jeans. In the story, his relationship with Jean V will, uh, you know, twist around considerably over the years. King of France that gave young Gilles land grants, uh, then gives, excuse me, young Gilles land grants as a reward, which was why some of these guys fought so hard too. They would be rewarded with riches, uh, get some more property. Uh, as a young man, several sources have said that Gilles was impetuous, hot headed, made him rude person in everyday life, but a great soldier on the battlefield. Several peers would describe him as a skilled and fearless fighter. November of 1420, Grandpa Jean makes a third attempt at getting Gilles married, which finally works out. Gilles now marries a rich heiress, Catherine de Troyes. Catherine heiress to uh, one of the biggest fortunes in all of France. But because she was a woman, was not able to access that money unless she got herself a husband. Lucifina not pleased. Catherine was also Gilles' first cousin. Finally, getting back to a story where there's some hot cousin fucking going on. Uh, their marriage was forbidden by the church, but Grandpa Jean had a plan for a little workaround. What if Catherine changed her name to Martha and said she was from Canada and just pretended to be a secret Canadian bride when priests and stuff were around? What about, what about that? What about that? Or rather than suggest a stupid plan, including a country that didn't exist yet and a land no one knew about, uh, no one knew about uh, Jean told Jill to kidnap Catherine so they could marry in secret. Then try to convince the church to perform an official ceremony later after they'd already, you know, started fucking and stuff. So he kind of did suggest a stupid plan after all, but it worked. These families had a lot of money, a lot of influence, a lot of incentive for the church to bend the rules for them a bit. They're tithing a, a lot of coins. They're tossing a lot of coins to the witcher. Uh, also established a precedent of Gilles defying church protocol. Good way to wind up dead if you're not careful. Uh, the ceremony would not take place until 1422. Not much is known about Catherine. She was the daughter of Millet de Troyes, a lord, and Beatrice de Montjean. Her family owned vast territory. In addition to the church, Catherine's father supposedly disapproved of their marriage because of them being first cousins. He was a, he's a real prude. He's a real stickler. Bad cousin fucking. According to Catherine's parents, Gilles abducted her, forced her to marry him. Malay de Troyes tried to have the marriage absolved, but then died before he could make any progress in that regard. After he dies, Gilles and maybe also Grandpa Jean, they take possession of Catherine's property. Noice! Several sources have said that Gilles' marriage to Catherine made him the richest man in all of France, perhaps even surpassing the wealth of the king. Makes him very powerful. And possibly makes him a big target to take down so others can take what is his. After this marriage, Gilles starts to uh, only sign his first name on documents, which was a big flex. This was highly unusual, big protocol breach. Only princes were supposed to do that. right? Only princes are supposed to sign with just the, the one name. Uh, so why did Gilles do that? Some historians speculate it, it was a bit of a flex, right? A bit of like, I should be prince. I, I'm a fucking better fighter. I'm more wealthy, own more land than the prince. Maybe I should be king. Which is, you know, uh, a great way to end up getting taken down a peg, to be getting burned alive. After his marriage, Jean Ducron's first wife dies. He marries uh, Anne de Sier, Catherine's grandmother, further strengthening alliances in the family. And a little weird. Gilles and his wife now have the exact same set of grandparents. Uh, Anne's grandson, Gilles de Sier, will later become an accomplice in the crimes against children if uh, these accounts are to be believed. 1422, Catherine's mother, Beatrice de Monzon, uh, fights against the marriage of Catherine and Gilles after she marries Jacques uh, Mesquin de la roche Errol, a fucking knight with a crazy long name, who is also a chamberlain, basically a treasurer in the Dauphin's court. Uh, the Dauphin being the oldest son of the king, you know, heir to the French throne, if I haven't made that clear. But the papacy approves Gilles and Catherine's marriage anyway. And again, they're basically already married. 
Uh, it just hasn't been officially recognized yet. And the Pope, you know, has a lot of incentive to improve the marriage because they're very rich. After the approval, uh, Mezkin approaches the couple, now demands certain properties from them as part of his wife's dowry. Her daughter was the heir to the family fortune, got it when she's married to Gilles, but now mom's new man wants some of that fortune back for mom. 1423, in response to Mezkin's, or Mezkin's demands, Gilles and Grandpa John, they kidnap Gilles' wife's mom, <laughs> Beatrice and Beatrice's younger sister, Catherine's aunt, and fucking imprison them, both at the family castle uh, Champtosis. They said that if Beatrice did not renounce her claim on some of her daughter and her son-in-law's lands, well, guess who's getting sewn up in a fucking sack and thrown into the goddamn river? Also threatened her husband. That was a real threat. It seems extreme, right? The sewing her into a sack, thrown in the river, it seems, it seems a bit much. Uh, to ensure that they're taken seriously, Grandpa Jean kidnaps three of Mesquine's men and throws them into a pit. These guys aren't fucking around. Thankfully, uh, Anne de Sillé, Beatrice's mother, and Jean's wife persuade him to release the women. <laughs> I forgot for a second how Grandpa Jean's connected all this. He helps, kidnaps, he helps kidnap his wife's daughter and his grandson's wife's mother. Uh, Gilles de Ray and family starting to feel like the Lannisters from Game of Thrones. And Ms. Keen has to pay a ransom now to get his men out of the pit. Uh, Gilles definitely making some enemies here. Jacques de Mezquin later goes to court. Beatrice has granted some family land after all this drama, but not as much as they initially wanted. But then when the president of parliament comes to Gilles and Catherine's castle to see that the settlement is signed, uh, Jean and Gilles pay to have that fucking dude assaulted. What's going on? Parliament then finds them and uh, then they don't pay it. These bros looking pretty reckless. Powerful feudal lords could get away with this kind of shit because the king needed them for military resources, especially in this time of near constant war. But if you act like this, and then later, maybe you're not, you know, needed as much, well, now people might pounce on you. Two years later, 1425, Gilles formally presented at the court of the Dauphin. Uh, Dauphin. Despite having some goons beat the shit out of the president of parliament, quickly gains favor in the royal court, gets a military promotion, a big one, he's a commander now. Also, maybe, Gilles starts getting real fucking creepy around this time. Uh, while Gilles was at court and away from Catherine, according to his testimony later at his murder trial he researched sexual sadism and homosexuality i should point out that he does this before even meeting joan of arc some of his favorite books were written by suetonius a second century uh, roman historian second century ce who detailed how many roman emperors were bisexual and committed violent sexual acts against others jill will say at his trial that these stories these these books he finds in the royal court you know uh, lead him to begin fantasizing about children or was he already fantasizing about kids and this book, you know, these books just helped normalize that for him. A 1427, Jill takes a break from beating off to thoughts of sexually torturing children to go to battle or at least beats off less for a while. I I'm guessing it would be hard to win a sword fight when you got one hand on your hard dick and your mind is not really in the fight because you're thinking about, you know, taking a bubble bath with some kids or something. He fights. For the Duchess of Anjou against the English and further improves his mili military reputation with a victory. Also hires 10-year-old Etienne uh, Corolla as a page. Maybe starts fucking him. Nick's nicknames uh, Etienne uh, Poitou, which is the French term for perfect butthole. Or it's French for who knows. I don't know. Google's French translator doesn't convert it into a different word. Once Poitou gets older, he becomes a valet, a servant responsible for the clothes and personal belongings of an employer, making minor arrangements on their behalf, also an active participant in killing children. 1429, around the age of 25, Gilles meets Joan of Arc after King Charles assigns him to personally watch over her in battle. So he is very well respected militarily. Uh, this is actually well documented. He and Joan proceed to fight, uh, you know, alongside each other, fight very well together. In some of the uh, major battles of the war, one of which is the Siege of Orléans, does he also perhaps develop romantic feelings for her? I don't know, possibly. At the very least, he is said to have platonically cared for her a great deal and very much admired her. Jill may have gotten this appointment because he was a badass in battle or also because he had the biggest army of any member of the French aristocracy at this time or both. Uh, he used his wealth to form a large army as nobles were expected to do. King Charles did not have a standing army at this time, relying instead on his nobles to provide military forces. Gilles also offered other services to the French crown, showed up to the royal court with 30 carts of food and 100 beasts for the war effort, just written in documents as beasts. You know, not being saintly here, this is noble business. 
This is 1-800-BUSINESS. If he can win some battles, he'll acquire more land and wealth and his uh, investment will be paid, uh, will uh, you know, reward him handsomely. Charles relieved to have the help because he's you know, desperate for resources. Uh, Gilles was in court for Joan's arrival and at a meeting, he presented himself as a volunteer for the king to take arms and provisions with her to Orléans. Over a period of just nine days, Gilles and Joan will lead an army to victory and become national heroes. They fight in the name of God and Michael the Archangel, which makes them heroes in the eyes of the French church as well. Gilles was a devout Christian, at least publicly, which is why some wrote that he respected and, and admired Joan so greatly because she was so devout. Some sources say he idolized her. July 17th, 1429, after Charles's coronation, uh, he had been king, really, you know, the, the Dauphin since 1422, but not coronated until 1429 due to English and Burgundian forces having siege and kept hold of the city of Rheims for years, the city where French kings were traditionally coronated. Gilles appointed Marshal of France now on the same day, the highest military distinction in the country. He's the leader of all of France's military. He, like Joan, stood by Charles' side at the coronation, had the honor of collecting the essential oil for a ceremony. With his promotion, he inherited a new coat of arms, even more power, land, and privileges. After his promotion, Gilles continues to serve in Joan's special guard and was even with her when she later fought in Paris. Later that year, Gilles and Catherine's only child, Marie, is born. After this, they, the couple is rarely seen together. Maybe because their marriage was, you know, largely political and not a marriage of love. Or maybe because Gilles de Ray, too busy dreaming of torturing fucking kids and trying to conjure demons and shit, uh, you know, to be real into his wife. Okay, now we're going to May 30th, 1431. Joan of Arc, after being captured by the Burgundians, not helped by the Pope or King Charles, as I talked about earlier, and handed over to the English, is burned at the stake for heresy. Jill, devastated by the loss of his close friend and battle partner, feels betrayed by God, by church, by the church, by the country. You know, they'd all abandoned Joan. Feels that his years of worship and piety, you know, meant nothing if that was what could happen to someone as devout as Joan. And he goes into, uh, you know, solitary, uh, you know, to grieve, to, re to reflect for a while. He's off, he's off alone. Joe may have planned to rescue Joan. He spent the winter of 1430 and 1431 at Louvier, 15 miles from Rouen, where Joan was held. If he did make a plot to rescue her, uh, he never went through with it, though. Contrary to popular belief, according to historical documents, Jill does not actually retire immediately after Joan's execution. He continues to fight in various battles, uh, continues to get some victories in the Hundred Years' War. Uh, for example, early August of 1432, Gilles and his army fight the English near Lonnie, and uh, he, he wins this big battle, mirroring his efforts at Orléans. Afterwards, he then lets his men pillage and plunder the town. Probably a, probably a fair amount of raping went on, which was unusual behavior for him. He hadn't done that previously. Is he growing more cruel, becoming sadistic? His grandfather, Jean, notices, becomes worried. Jill and John had a strained relationship after 1429 when Jill sold a family estate to an outsider. John was furious, bought it back, then publicly shamed his grandson. And they never spoke much or spent time together after that. November 15th, 1432, uh, Jean, uh, Jean Ducron passes away. His relationship with Jill still strained and he actually gives a final insult to Jill by handing down his sword and armor, not to Jill, but to his younger brother, René, which is a protocol breach. This may have marked another turning point for Gilles. Some of his relatives, many will later testify at his trials, felt like his grandpa kept his uh, grandson's more reckless impulses, at least partially in check. Now he's untethered and his behavior worsens. After Jean dies, Gilles begins selling more estates to live the lavish life he wants. Over a period of about six years, he will allegedly sell around 40 properties and castles to finance a very decadent lifestyle. He hosts lavish parties, invests in making his remaining estates more decadent for hosting all kinds of events. He purchases elaborate decor for his estates, pays servants, staffs a large military retinue, uh, constantly commissioning new music and literature. Also seems that Jill uh, will blow a lot of money on the theater to commemorate his victories in battle, especially victories fought alongside Joan of Arc. He funds essentially massive uh, battle reenactments, very large scale. I'll share details about these later. Because he sells historic family lands to finance his luxury lifestyle, many of his family now grow angry with him. He is, in their eyes, squandering away their family fortune. According to Britannica, he kept a more lavish court than the king. The Gilles castles became uh, known for being party castles. Oh, fuck yeah. Constantly uh, hosting a new play, a pageant, a festival, a banquet, a tournament. You know, he invites many of the locals. 
For many of the performances, he's hiring boys, choirs, jesters, jugglers. He's paying for food for his guests, purchasing uh, oxen and sheep to feed massive groups of people, giant feasts. He keeps a personal physician at his side at all times, just in case he were to ever slip and fall, get out of bed, and possibly bend in his boner in half. Sorry, I don't know why that stupid gag. <laughs> so funny in my mind. I was, uh, I was amusing myself late last night. Okay, then in 1432, he allegedly began killing children. Much of the following comes from trial documents from 1440 that have survived to the present day. From 1432 to mid-1439, he supposedly murdered sporadically. And the frequency of his killings then ramped up considerably in late 1439 after he hired this weird fucking wizard necromancer dude who convinced him that a demon would shower, shower him with wealth if he would just make the proper sacrifices. Oh yeah, shit's about to get darker and weirder. His primary targets are little boys. Supposedly occasionally uh, he killed girls as well. In his trial, it's noted that when he raped the, the girls, he avoided their, quote, natural vessel, uh, i.e. their vagina, which he, quote, disdained, preferring to sodomize them before killing them. His MO was to target children from peasant or lower class families, lure them to his castle with food, toys, or clothes, or just have them kidnapped. Uh, you know, he'd convince uh, parents to give them their children in exchange for money, clothes, food. He assured many of their parents that they would, uh, you know, be trained to be knights or choir singers or whatever. If he ever met the parents, which seems uh, to have been rare, many of his targets were the children of the beggars who came to the castle looking for food or kids, you know, would show up as lone beggars wandering up to the wrong castle. When Jill saw the beggars come by, he would tell a servant, you know, if he wanted the child or not or which child he wanted if there were multiple kids. When they came inside, uh, he or his servants would uh, feed the kids, let them, let them play with the toys for a little bit if they were very young. And then eventually Jill would take them into his private chambers where he would imprison, torture, rape and ultimately kill them. He would confess at his trial that he liked watching how the children became afraid when he would explain to them what was about to happen to them, which is fucking horrific. Also said he preferred to murder them via throat slitting or decapitation. Afterwards, he would have their bodies and belongings burned and then dump their ashes and bones into his moat. But sometimes he would keep the heads as some sort of trophy. Uh, more about the fucked up shit he might've done with their heads in a bit. If half of the allegations against him are true, this guy was the fucking devil uh, the last years of his life. Jill confessed to having secret entrances all around his palaces that allowed him to have children snuck in or allow him to sneak out, allow his henchmen to drag kids in or sneak out to dispose of their remains. His wife, Catherine, often lived elsewhere during all of this or at least would stay in her own private residence in a different area of the castle if they were together uh, due to the cold, loveless nature of their relationship. The Inquisition into his activities would determine that he initially was helped by four separate accomplices. Onwe, Griere, uh, Poitou, remember, old perfect butthole, uh, Roger Brickville, and Gilles Dussier. Excuse me, Dussier. Uh, Gilles Dussier was the main one to go out and search for fresh victims. Gilles was also helped by various snatchers, generally old women he would pay to search the countryside for children. This is insane. Uh, DeRay essentially created and employed his own criminal enterprise. It's a fucking Jeffrey Epstein, but worth, but worse. Uh, his valet, uh, Poitou, would later testify that Jill often hung his victims from a hook, not in a way that pierced their skin, but in a way like they would have trouble breathing, like, you know, something around their neck. And then while they fought for air, would masturbate onto them. When he was done, he would remove the, uh, the, the kids from the hook uh, and then tell them that he was just goofing around. They're just playing. Uh, come on, dry those tears. We're, we're just goofing. We're just being silly gooses and having a little laugh, having a, having a lark. Did he know that these are the fun kind of games that nobles play? And then he'd kill them or have Gilles uh, Poitois uh, or Anway kill them. Although we don't have the full list of his victims, many parents would come forward, like many, many parents, during his inquisition to testify that Gilles was responsible, responsible for their children's deaths. Uh, his first alleged victim, a peasant boy, he tricked into entering his castle. The 12-year-old son of a man named, this is going to shock you, Jean. Mm -hmm. Jean Joudon. 1432, cousins uh, Jill Dussier and Roger de Brickville approached a local furrier named Guillaume Hilliere, who apprenticed the boy. They asked if they could use him as a page to get a message to Mashku, to the Mashku castle, uh, the main murder castle at that time. <clears throat> Excuse me, Hilliere agrees, and then the boy never returns. When asked, Jill and Roger said that they knew nothing and that perhaps the boy was kidnapped. Uh, stealing children, sadly, was shockingly common back then. Uh, children, as I mentioned earlier, often kidnapped by landlords or nobles who would, you know, basically enslave them. 1432, uh, Jeannot Roussans, nine-year-old cousin, disappears. 
A witness saw Gilles Dussier speaking with him about the time he vanished. Uh, Jean Edeline, a widow, or excuse me, Jean, Jean Edeline, a widow who lived near Moshku, reported that her eight-year-old son went missing. People did search for him, but never found him. While the search was ongoing, the sons of Moshe Sorin and Alexander Chastelet also disappeared. All of these disappearances eventually tied to Gilles de Ray. 1433, Gilles finances the construction of a chapel. For the bliss of his soul, he names it the Chapel of Holy Innocence. Pretty fucked up if you're doing that while torturing, raping, and killing kids. Pays for the chapel because he wants to attend church from the comfort of his own home. Or because he would like to use it to lure more kids to him. And also make him seem like the kind of guy who isn't, you know, doing a bunch of horrible shit to kids. Church's name for a story in the book of Matthew. King Herod orders a mass killing of all children under two years old so that no child will grow up to overthrow him. The story was popular among the French at that time. They compared the Hundred Years' War to the story because of all the French children dying in the war. This chapel was built as a symbol of pacif- uh, pacis- oh my gosh, pacifism. Why was that word so hard all of a sudden? Uh, may have been designed to show that Gilles wanted the war to finally be over, uh, which in a way was pretty scandalous, actually. You know, nobles were profiting from the war and Jill is now no longer interested in it. His family, once again, angry at him for what they perceive as him, you know, standing their reputation. Also, nobles not supposed to build private churches like this, right? This was uh, uh, the right of princes. Jill allegedly, uh, Jill allegedly now thinks of himself truly as a prince because, yeah, only prince is supposed to build personal chapels like that at this time. So he's defying royal precedent, overstepping again, uh, Gilles also hires an astrologist to predict his future around this time, something else that normally only princes did in France in this era. Uh, and allegedly these astrologists took him for a shitload of money. Of course those grifters did. In retaliation for wasting money to build the chapel, the Duke of Brittany, Gilles' old friend who he'd helped save, you know, when he was uh, young as a teenager, a big friend of the Duray family, appeals to the Pope and argues that Gilles is addicted to spending money. He's out of control. He spent way too much fucking money. He requested the Pope deny Gilles' application to have the chapel accepted as an official part of the Catholic diocese as well. This is, again, it's a breach of protocol. Come on, don't let him go through with this. This is, uh, this is not cool. You know, too expensive, not a good look. Family's worried about it. Pope agrees with the Duke. Yeah, I don't think this is a good idea. Well, Gilles now, uh, you know, uh, could have interpreted this as a, as a sign again of the church letting him down. By late 1433, Gilles has already sold most of everything but his favorite core estates and those that came from his wife's inheritance. Lavish parties continue. He's surrounded by a a cast of people on the payroll, you know, socialites bleeding him dry. 1434, Gilles officially retires from military leadership. He's taking too much time away from his partying, from living lavishly. This also not a good look. Gilles does assemble troops to liberate the town of Grancey from the Duke of Burgundy in 1434 but he refused to participate personally and hands the command over to his brother, René. March 26, 1435, the Chapel of the Holy Innocents is open for business, even if the Pope won't sanction it. Gilles' church now does not have a Catholic priest to perform mass, but allegedly was not, he was not going to let that stop him, and he had tailors make him a priest costume and would perform mass himself. This, uh, if it happened, an outrageous act of blasphemy. That alone, way more than enough reason to have him burned to the stake. Uh, Gilles clearly making a statement here that he is uh, very powerful, as powerful as the church itself. He doesn't need their, their permission. Gilles also personally selects boys uh, you know, to perform in the choir, sing at his chapel, not known how many of these boys would become his victims, but supposedly many. Uh, Gilles also began to dabble more seriously in the occult to try to save his spiraling financial situation. And this was not entirely unheard of doing things like this. He begins to employ alchemists and sorcerers to help him out. Fucking alchemy. Such quackery. Uh, Alchemists, fairly popular this time. Pseudoscientists, uh, shysters, performing all kinds of experiments in order to try and cure diseases, uh, achieve immortality, turn common metals into gold. That was the biggest one. You know, make gold. All kinds of shit that no one has ever been able to achieve. Might as well try and find that old wizard fireball scroll from the Library of Alexandria. I have to imagine that most of these alchemists were either scam artists or, you know, had some form of mental illness. Sorcerers were people who thought they could, or at least, you know, would make others think they could, uh, cast all sorts of spells, make all sorts of potions. But uh, I don't think they ever pulled that off. Interestingly, whenever these people were sentenced to be burned at the stake for heresy, not a single one were able to wizard their way out of the flames. 
Not one. Almost like it's a bunch of bullshit. Burn the witch. Burn the wizard. Burn the alchemist. May 8th, 1435, the opening performance of Gilles' biggest play, A Mystère du Orléans, takes place. He spends tons of money preparing for this massive play for each performance, and there'll be many performances. He pays tailors to make 600 brand new costumes fresh for the battle reenactment. Uh, Mystère du Orléans uh, was a theatrical reenactment of his battle at Orléans with Joan of Arc. The full production cost 80,000 crowns, performed for about a year. Uh, no way to really translate how much 80,000 crowns would be equivalent to today. It was, uh, it was a shit ton. It was approximately a shit ton of money. Uh, his play had approximately 150 speaking roles, 500 extras to act as battle soldiers. Also gave his staff and audience free buffets, which meant that everyone from town would show up you know, to watch this reenactment of his glory. Gilles was providing jobs, feeding hungry peasants, but his family, again, fucking angry at him because he's wasting so much money. He's not making anything from this. He's doing this for vanity. July of 1435, Gilles' family fed up with his excessive spending and selling. Some of them go be uh, for the king now to obtain an order to stop anyone from being able to enter into a business transaction with him. No one is able to buy his property now or give him a loan. They're worried he will soon spend all of the money and the family estate will be gone forever. In one generation, he is wiping out centuries worth of wealth and property accumulation. They secure their decree from King Charles, preventing him from selling any more of his lands to finance his lifestyle, and he is not allowed to use his estates to secure loans. The other term of this agreement is that the Duke of Brittany will now control all of his finances. After looking over Jill's financial records, he discovers he's in debt, and the Duke now begins to buy some of his properties to get him out of debt, asterisk, uh, or the Duke had ulterior motives, wanted his property because it was situated on the border of the Duchy of Brittany and wanted to increase the power of his own estate. Uh, this decree from King Charles did not bar Gilles from selling estates to the Duke of Brittany, who would purchase property under an agreement that Gilles would be able to buy it back within six years once he's able to get his estates in order. But, you know, if he's fucking burned alive, well, then he just gets to keep it. Uh, and Gilles had no interest in trying to make uh, money. He just wanted to keep spending. He wasn't interested in getting his finances in order. May of 1436, Gilles finds out that his childhood teacher, uh, Michel uh, Dufontenay, oversaw the publication of the decree from King Charles forbidding others from engaging in large financial transactions with him. So he abducts and imprisons that guy. And I imagine slaps him around a bit. The bishop and some officers from the university in uh, Champtosis protest until this guy is released. Since he couldn't sell land, Gilles now sells clothes, jewels, art, books, uh, uses that stuff as collateral for loans. S uh, also sells as much as he can to the Duke of Brittany. All of this still not enough to fund the lifestyle he wants. So he looks further to black magic, fascinated by the dark arts, by all these fucking grifters promising him all kinds of fortune. Seems to think it's possible to find the right spell or formula to wildly change your financial future, right? Self-delusion, such a powerful force when you want something bad enough. He develops again, according to tortured confessions uh, and, and family and other witness testimony later, an interest in devil worship, hopes to gain knowledge, power, and money by winning the devil's favor. Also continues his obsession with alchemy. He becomes so obsessed with alchemy, he allegedly turns a large section of one of his castles into a big laboratory. Invites alchemists and sorcerers from all over Europe. To fuck, get in there and make some goddamn gold already. But none, of course, are able to do it. Right? It's a total scam. Uh, they still can't do it, despite what a bunch of sites on the web claim right now today. All these motherfuckers, delusional scammers or some combination. Right? You cannot make an element out of other elements with the one theoretical exception of a specific kind of nuclear reaction. Complicated process where you'd have to spend so much more money than you would get. Right? You'd have to use a nuclear reactor. First, you got to get your hands on one of those and some other elements to then make a teeny tiny amount of gold. 1439, Jill sends a Eustache Blanchet, a priest and friend of his to Italy to find a real magician. Local prospects are just not working out. He's getting frustrated. May of 1439, uh, Eustache returns with Francois Prolati. Prolati Bugatti Maserati. A sorcerer. Uh, this guy kind of shows up out of nowhere. We don't know who he was before he shows up in Jill's life. Uh, Prolati approaches Jill's, uh, or Jill and tells him that he will need Satan's help <laughs> to make the gold. All right, okay. He says that to get the devil's help, you have to commit a heinous act in the devil's name. And Jill was like, oh, shit, not a problem. Oh, man, I'm real good at committing heinous acts. 
<laughs> I got heinous down. Just need to add the devil's name, I guess, to the shit I've been doing for years. But for real, uh, Jill allegedly agrees, willing to do anything to make this gold. They try to contact some demon named Baron and perform ceremonies to summon him. And who the fuck is this demon? Strongly guessing old Nadi Perlati made his ass up because Barone does not show up in any uh, demonology compendiums I might happen to possess for reasons you don't need to fucking know about. And I can't find him on any uh, internet demon list. Guessing on how to pronounce his name, it's spelled B-A-R-R-O-N. Almost Barry. Let's call him Barry. Going for it. I like, I like the name Barry for a demon. Uh, Perlati wanted Barry the demon. <laughs> Specifically because Bear Bear uh, would supposedly bring a lot of money and appear as a handsome man well, while doing it, when properly summoned. According to Perlati, uh, Perlati, oh, hottie body Perlati, uh, Barone wanted to sacrifice, old Barry, made of a heart and some limbs, which is pretty gruesome, pretty weird, and very specific. And with this sacrifice of children's blood, I do summon thee, demon, arise, Barry, bring thee the riches I desire. Oh, damn, bro, you, you just off that kid for nothing. What what does thou mean, demon? Uh, why does thou vex me? Bro, you must have read the wrong ritual. Easy to do. A lot of knockoffs out there. I do not need the blood of children. I need an eyeball, left leg, and a few fingers. What does it matter, demon? A child is dead. I already burned the body. Why is thou so picky? Silence, bro. Demons do not stand for questioning. Why should I require uh, blood by your logic? Why not hand out magical riches just to be a, a, a nice, cool guy just for shits and giggles? I demand what I demand because I'm evil, you silly fuck. And what is it that we evil beings do? We perpetuate more evil. Duh. You know, something like that. Uh, Jill proceeded to fill entire books with magic formulas and rituals now that he thinks might create or perform, uh, you know, or entice a Barry or the devil to appear. After many failures, Perlotti tells Jill that Barry, well, he's not appearing... Because, Jill, you're wearing a cross necklace. And that's what's keeping him away. Uh, what? Let me get this straight. Jill is willing to sever the limbs of children, rip out their hearts to appease a demon. Uh, he's been raping and torturing and killing all kinds of kids for quite some time. But won't take off his cross necklace. Anyone else bumping on that detail? Uh, from June to July of 1439, Prelati, Jill, uh, Jill Dussier, uh, Eustache Blanchet, en way, uh, Poitou, perfect bottle, uh, prepare the lower hall of the castle for more attempts at invoking a demon. Guessing DeRay has uh, taken off his cross necklace now. Uh, these new sessions take place at Gilles' castle in uh, Tifoge. There, Prolati the grifter pretends to summon the devil. Uh, skipping, fuck, just jumping right over Barry right now. During one session where Prolati works alone, he says that, uh, I actually, he, sometimes sources say the devil, sometimes they say Barry. So maybe he was going for the devil, maybe he's going for Bear Bear. Uh, during one session, when Prelati is working alone, he says that Barry the demon has shown up. Holy shit! And that wily fucker finally brought Jill the gold he sought. Oh, woo! Fuck yeah, bro! Uh, Jill races in to try and see it, but Prelati stops him. Saves his life from a magical green serpent he said was now guarding the money. And they have to run away. And then when they come back later, gosh dang, there's no gold. Oh, damn you, magic snake! To ensure that Jill kept employing him, Prelati would sometimes hide gifts that would allegedly come from Barry around the castle. I hope they were like shitty gifts. Oh, look at that muffin. That must be from Barry. He wants you to keep trying. Uh, disillusioned with the results of the rituals, soon uh, Jill returns to murder to try and renew his fortune. Prelati tells him he has to offer a child to please Satan and Barry. So Jill has a peasant boy kidnapped and murdered. He offers up the body parts, but he refuses to also sell his soul. Prelati tells him, that, you know, the fuck, it's not going to work. This, it's not going to happen if you don't sell your soul. First the necklace, now the soul. Prelati has been doing everything. Just buy the book. Bull Jilly half-ass just won't commit. Come on, Jill. In for a penny, in for a pound, you half-ass devil fucking worshiper. Despite this refusal, Prelati later testifies that Jill doubles, doubles down on the child's sacrificing part. Maybe he thinks that he offers Barry the demon enough hearts, eyes, and sexual organs of children He'll forget about, you know, not giving him his soul. Uh, I'm joking around a bunch, but what if he was actually doing all of this? What if he was so desperate, so morally just bankrupt and broken at this point? He's just hacking up kids left and right to try and please this demon. Yee. 
August of 1439, Gilles Valet, Poitou, approaches the aunt of a boy named Colin Avril, asks if he can borrow the child to show him the house of the Archdeacon of Merrill. He promises to give Colin a loaf of bread. His aunt insists on going with him, uh, but the next day, Colin goes alone and then never comes home. According to accomplice Enwe, uh, Gilles raped Colin, killed him, and then burned his body. August 26, 1439, Poitou brings 15-year-old Bernard Lacamas to Gilles' castle at Bourneuf. Chambermaid sees Poitou speaking to Bernard. She's suspicious, asks him what they're talking about, but Bernard won't tell her. And then he disappears from the castle and is never seen again. November 1st, 1439, the priest, Eustache Blanchet, leaves Gilles' castle after arguing with one of the employees. Allegedly, he was pretty sick of the child's sacrifices. You know, that's why he left. He went to go, he went to go stay at an inn in Montaigne. Who is this priest? Guys, I'm fucking out. You know, between the constant demon worship and, and the child fucking and torturing and raping, I just, well, you know what? I'm going to say it. It doesn't sit right with me. It just doesn't sit right with me. Uh, December of 1439, Jean Marseille uh, Castellan of Lorouche Soyon travels to Montaigne and stays at the same inn as Blanchet. The innkeeper asks Jean for news from Nantes. Blanchet overhears Jean speaking about rumors that the Baron Dure is killing children so he can now write a book with their uh, blood and the Baron believes he can use this book to seize any land he wants oh hell yeah the day after hearing this conversation one of Gilles' emissaries comes to the inn to try to get Blanchet to return he refuses tells the messenger that Gilles has to stop killing because the rumors are getting out of hand early December King Charles VII's son Louis is sent to visit Gilles at Tifouge uh, because he's supposed to stop armed bands of marauders. Jill was one of the nobles on his list to visit. Jill allegedly panics, destroys all the alchemy ovens inside his castle before the visit. December 10th, 1439, Jeanne Druet sends two of her sons, seven and ten years old, to ask for alms at the castle in Machu. She knows Jill uh, distributed uh, them there and that men in the village were charitable. Witnesses say the boys, uh, they saw the boys in the area when Jeanne went herself, though she couldn't find him or them. December 25th, 1439, Isabeau uh, Hameline sends two of her sons, seven and 15, to buy bread, and they never return. December 26th, 1439, Perlati and Marquis de Sava come to Isabeau's door, Isabeau's door. She knew the men worked for the Baron de Ray. They saw her daughter and other son inside the house, asked if she had more children. She said yes, but didn't mention their recent disappearance. Then as they left, she heard one of them say, two had come from that house. Hmm. January of 1440, new accomplice, Marquis de Savard, engages the teen boy to work as Perlotti's page. The boy stays at Mashku for two weeks and disappears. Perlotti said the boy stole from him and ran away, but on way would tell a different story. In his confession later at court, he said that Perlotti killed the teen at Mashku. Two more boys disappear around this time, one a page of a nobleman, another the nephew of a priest who sent him off to learn to read and write. In January, the following year, Eustache Blanchet, wayward priest, persu is persuaded to rejoin Gilles' household. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, I should have never left over the devil worship and, the, you know, the kid fucking stuff. How, how judgy? <laughs> how judgy was I? I feel silly. Forgiveness, right? I got to be more in touch with forgiveness. And I forgive you. And I forgive, you know, whatever else you're going to do in the future. Uh, March 27th, 1440, Eustache Blanchet sees Poitois. All perfect butthole enter the castle with the 16-year-old uh, Guillaume Le Billet, son of a village pastry cook, and Guillaume is never seen again. From March 27th to May 15th, 1440, two more boys disappear. One was the 15-year-old son of a mason. We don't know his name. Thank the Lord. Do you have any idea how fucking sick I am of <laughs> trying to say French kids' names? Uh, Poitou. I think I'm doing all right, though. But Poitou persuaded the boy's mother to send him to the castle. Another was a 10-year-old boy whose parents sent him to beg for alms. 1440, rumors are spreading that lots of kids going missing near the castle of champ primary current residence of Gilles de Ray. Many of the disappearances connected to the, either him or his servants. If a boy was taken to that castle by nobles as a servant or a page, man, they just would never be seen again. For many in Brittany now, the disappearances have become an open secret. People know that Gilles is doing what he's doing, but are too scared to say anything, which does seem plausible, right? Going up against a noble was a great way to get yourself killed if you're a peasant back then. And they did often mistreat, you know, uh, their villagers. Uh, at this time, according to several sources, lords, barons, or any member of the noble class, uh, you know, could basically murder, steal, torture, rape, whenever they fucking wanted with certainty that the king would not intervene as long as they could be counted on again to raise an army, as I mentioned before. 
But as long as the nobles squeeze enough tax money from the peasants beneath them to pay the crown enough gold to keep them happy. What a time to be alive. Uh, the church again would not intervene as long as nobles paid their tithes to the church, as long as there were not reports of heresy, you know, open heresy. May 15th, 1440, Jill fucks up. It's one thing to constantly rape, torture, kill kids willy-nilly and try and sacrifice them to the devil. It is another thing to blatantly, once again, disrespect the church. Oh man, I just uh, uh, threw my notes all over the place. <laughs> Got a little excited with my, uh, with my touchpad. Uh, this time he stormed into a church where a priest named Jean de Ferron, every third person named Jean, uh, is conducting mass. And Jill, fully armed while he does this, a crime punishable by excommunication, excommunication and or death. Just that, entering this church, uh, you know, fully armed while the priest is conducting mass. Why does he do this? Well, Jill had learned that one of his favorite castles had been sold and that Jean Laferon had something to do with it. It may be in his possession. After mass ends, Jill runs in, um, you know, or up to him, excuse me, yells, you beat my men, extorted from them, come outside the church or I'll kill you on the spot. And then he kidnapped the priest. Pretty big no-no. Because of this, Jean V, still Duke of Brittany, finds him 50,000 gold crowns. Jill then moves the priest to Tifoge, outside the Duke's territory, and keeps him prisoner there until the church later intervenes. People are shocked, right? Word spreads all the way to the king, king and the pope. Now they're worried that Jill's become too reckless, too dangerous. Something has to be done. Jill's family also circulating rumors that he has gone fucking mad. He's experimenting with alchemy and wizards and shit. They're spreading rumors that Jill and Francois Prelati are forbidden lover, lovers, summoning demons together. Duke now makes a formal complaint against Jill to the king and the king sends authorities to investigate him. Secular and ecclesiastical authorities end up investigating from the king and the church. July 29th, 1440, the Bishop of Nantes publishes his letters of evidence against Gilles and gets prosec prosecutorial cooperation from Duke Jean V to charge Gilles with murder. After Duke Jean V complains to the bishop in May, the bishop launches a private investigation and uh, had found evidence that Gilles was murdering children. So yeah, this, that, that happened you know, previous to this uh, letter now. Jean V, now so confident that Jill is going to be convicted of crimes he will be executed for, he promises some of Gilles' property to his brother, Arthur du Richemont, constable of France, if he will help with the trial. So that's cool. Two guys who will be able to take Gilles' property if he's found guilty are now part of his secular investigation and trial. The constable seizes uh, Tefoge and frees the priest Jean de Ferron. Gilles Dussier and Roger de Brickville flee, leaving Gilles behind. Gilles sets up a reconciliation meeting with the Duke. And to play things safe, before this meeting, he orders Perlotti the wizard to ask Barry the demon if it's going to be a trap. Because, you know, Barry has been so fucking helpful so far. Three children are apparently killed to get a response from the demon. I know that's not funny. It's just so fucking ridiculous. Uh, Barry gives him the green light now. According to uh, Barry the demon, all coasts are clear. It's cool. Meeting's going to be fine. It's going to work out great. Well, it wasn't. Secretly, the Duke had reported Jill to the Bishop of Nantes for sacrilege, assault, and heresy. Fucking Barry! How could you steer him in the wrong direction? Jill set out for the meeting, not knowing he's going to be arrested. The group stopped overnight to rest on the way. That night, Jill allegedly raped, murdered, and decapitated a 10-year-old boy. Jill murders his last victim, August 15th, 1440. Poitou uh, lured a young boy by telling his mother he needed, a he needed a page, and Jill murdered the child and burned the body. Jill indicted September 13th, 1440, without his knowledge. Charged with sodomy, murder, invoking demons, heresy, and offending divine majesty. Then Jill is arrested two days later on September 15th, 1440, and is so very mad at Barry. He was at Mashku when the Duke's men arrived and announced they were there to arrest him, and he went without complaint. Perlotti, Blanchet, Poitou, uh, Enway, also arrested. Now that Jill and his accomplices are finally arrested, witnesses feel like they can come forward. Before, as I mentioned, they said they were too scared that Jill would have his men kill them. All of the witnesses confirmed he was responsible for many, many child murders. One witness reported seeing his men carry out 40 skeletons from a tower. Weird that that would uh, be the number. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that felt like a lot to, to witness. 40 skeletons, I counted each and every bone. Maybe it just looked like uh, somewhere in the ballpark of 40 skeletons. Uh, Gilles had 49 charges against him. 17 were witchcraft. Five were for murdering children. This is just initial charges. This, and this is from the church. This may suggest that the church thought summoning demons worse than killing children. Probably. 
Uh, Gilles' ecclesiastical trial begins September 19th, 1440. This trial, one of the most well-documented trials of murder in the Middle Ages. At his ecclesiastical trial, Gilles read his charges ordered to appear before the vice inquisitor and the Bishop of Nantes on September 28th. Gilles tried at the same time in civil court for heresy, sodomy, and murder. Uh, one thing that's interesting about these two courts is that at this time, the church was known to be more lenient. They would typically uh, sentence criminals to life in prison or excommunication in France. The civil courts, however, quicker to hand down a death sentence, even for minor crimes. The secular proceedings led by the Chancellor of Brittany, Vicar of in the Inquisition, and the President of the Provincial Parliament. The trial held at the Duke of Brittany's court, right? The guy who is going to fucking gain all this guy's property if uh, Gilles goes down. <clears throat> Excuse me, the Bishop of Nantes, Jean de Malatois, presented his evidence against Gilles and gathered almost 100 witnesses to testify. September 28th, the ecclesiastical court joins the civil court to hear more testimony from parents of children who have uh, gone missing. There were so many witnesses that the testimony would last until October 8th. Over and over, they're telling their stories. On October 8th, uh, Gilles appears before the court for civil charges. Initially, he refuses to plead guilty or not guilty to the charges, uh, but then is threatened with excommunication, a surefire way to go to hell, and that finally gets him to plea, and he pleads not guilty initially. He also initially refused to talk, so the court asked if he would accept Enwe or Poitou's testimony instead. He was like, yes, they will tell the truth. Uh, he did not know that they were being tortured and were going to confess everything. Back then, if you were tortured, right, you typically had to make a confession whether you committed the crime or not. <clears throat> Excuse me. The court was going to get something out of you and they would not accept denial. You had to admit to whatever crime they accused you of oftentimes or, <laughs> or you'd be sentenced to death. So damned if you do, damned if you don't. Well, what a great way to get some justice. What a great way to get to the truth of things. October 13th, 1440, the prosecutor read the bill of indictment to uh, non government officials and the bishop. He argued that Gilles started killing children in 1426 and that he had killed 140 boys and girls. The indictment had 49 articles that listed all the charges from murder to witchcraft. Gilles interrogated about the 49 articles. He was defiant. He called his judges uh, simoniacs, uh, people who will, who will buy and sell church privileges, and ribalts, people who would use vulgar or indecent language. He said they had no right to judge him. He even told them, I would much prefer to be hanged by a rope around my neck than respond to such ecclesiastics and judges. A few minutes later, the bishop started a preemptory excommunication and now Jill quieted right down. He genuinely seemed to fear excommunication much more than death. Uh, odd for a man who supposedly was worshiping Barry the demon. On October 15th, 1440, Jill apologizes profusely to the judges, explains that he was terrified of excommunication and going to hell pleads guilty to all charges except invoking demons and begs for the excommunication to be lifted and the bishop agrees. He is not excommunicated. On October 16th, 1440, Prelati testifies. October uh, 17th, 1440, Eustache, Blanchet, uh, Enwe, Poitou also testify. The accomplices initially deny everything and said that Gilles was not a killer, but you know, then they get tortured and they change their opinions. They sign confessions testifying to their crimes. Possibly just to make the torture stop, but maybe there was something to it. Poitou testifies that Gilles started killing boys at uh, champ during the uh, lifetime of Jean Ducron, his grandfather. He gave 1426 as the date, said Gilles lured the boys inside, hung them from the ceiling until they were almost dead, then raped and killed them. If that wasn't enough for them, or for him, excuse me, he would also rape their corpses. Afterwards, he had Poitou and Enway dismember the bodies, burn them, and dump ashes into the moat which would be a great way to dispose of remains. Note to self, if I'm going to start killing a lot of people, uh, I should make sure that I have uh, some loyal henchmen, a large castle where I can hide the fact that I'm burning bodies, and a big-ass moat to dump ashes in. Uh, part of Poitou's court transcript says, Corla testified and said that while he was present and listening, he heard Jill boast that he took greater pleasure in killing and cutting the throats of these boys and girls and having them killed and their throats slit and seeing them languish and die and their heads and limbs cut off one after the other and in sight of their blood than he did abusing them sexually. Uh, Poitou also said that Gilles would put the children's heads and limbs on display sometimes and show them off to his accomplices. Mm -hmm. Even said that, <laughs> this is so fucking ridiculous. This is so dark. He said that he even had an incredibly morbid beauty contest where he asked his accomplices which of the dead children was the most beautiful. And then he would kiss the winner's severed head. 
So he just had a display of heads and he's like, what do you, what do you who do you think's the, 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 the hottest? I know <laughs> to my God that the way this trial is being conducted is far from ideal. But again, what if he really did this shit? Having, you know, all kinds of conflicts of interest and confessions made under duress doesn't mean he didn't do it. What if he really had a beauty contest with the recently decapitated heads of various peasant children who, who had been raped before being killed, been raped as they're being killed? That's one of the darkest acts we've come across so far. Doesn't top other serial killers eating kids or, you know, the torture methods of, say, the Kansas City butcher or, or the rape orientation cassette of the toy box killer. But, you know, right up there with that shit. Witnesses of the trial testified to seeing his servants dispose of dozens of children's bodies at a castle in 1437. Court documents indicate they went to the said tower, took the bones of 36 or 46 children to transport them to Mashku, took them to Gilles de Ray's room where the bones were burned. Poitou verified all this. Poitou's confession was apparently so terrifying that the judges ordered portions to be removed from the transcript. Man. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what was worse? What was worse than, you know, a kid head beauty contest? October 20th, 1440, the judges threatened Gilles with torture to get him to talk. The next day, October 21st, uh, Gilles begs to defer his torture, says he will confess. And he gives an out-of-court confession. And then uh, he confesses to all charges and admits that he ritualistically tortured dozens of children over a 10-year period, said his servants would kidnap the children and bring them to him. Uh, next day, he makes a full in-court confession giving all the gruesome details. Saturday, October, uh, Saturday, 22 October, the appearance of the accused. This is from the court documents. Gilles de Ray, who confesses in public the murder of children and admits himself that he killed or had killed such a large number that he is unable to give the amount. Gilles confessed he started killing in 1432 or 1433, so later than the date some of the other people talked about, confirms all of Poitou's and uh, Onway's testimony says that he and his accomplices inflicted various types and manners of torment on children. To kill them, he said he strangled them, smashed their heads with blunt objects, slit their throats, hung them from the hook, or decapitated them. Quote, with clubs or other instruments, he delivered violent blows to their heads, amputated them. He separated the head from the body with daggers and knives. Damn. As they died, he also said he would commit the sodomitic vice on them and then continue raping them after they died. Just truly went full evil. Also confessed to invoking evil spirits, making pacts with demons, and practicing alchemy. Said he would offer the demons anything but his own soul. He presented the heart, eyes, hand, and blood of one child to the demon Baron. Fucking Barry! Fed him so many kids, and he never helped Jill once. So, <laughs> it's almost like you can't trust a demon. Uh, he said he presented the limbs and genitals of other children. He also confessed to visiting heretics, conjurers, sorcerers, to learn about geomancy, necromancy, so much wizard shit. Brother Jean Bluon, a uh, vicar of the Inquisitor, wrote, Gilles the accused has been, was, and is a heretic, an apostate, a sorcerer, a sodomite, an invoker of evil spirits, diviner, murderer of innocent children, a criminal, a backslider, and an idolater who has deviated from the faith and who is illy disposed of it. In total, Gilles confessed to killing at least 140 kids. Gilles believed that if he confessed everything, God would forgive him. Near the end of his trial, he begged God for mercy. Court documents indicate that Gilles told the court that as a Christian, he was their brother and urged them and those among them whose children he had killed for the love of our Lord's suffering to be willing to pray to God for him and to forgive him freely. Gilles spoke with great contrition of heart and great grief according as it appeared at first sight and with a great effusion of tears, he begged parents present for forgiveness and apparently some of them did forgive him. Fucking what? Could you do that? I could not. Someone admits to raping your child as they also killed him, cutting their fucking limbs off to make a deal with a demon. And then when they cry and beg forgiveness, you're like, aha, that's okay. Everyone makes mistakes. I get it. No. October 23rd, 1440, Gilles found guilty of heresy. And the secular court finds him guilty of kidnapping, torture, and raising armed forces without the Duke's permission. The church, interestingly, starts to excommunicate him again, but they then later lifts the order. The same day, Poitou and Enwe are sentenced to death by hanging and burning. Uh, October 25th, uh, Gilles also sentenced to death by hanging and burning. Burn the witch! Burn the kid fucker! Burn Barry's bitch! Gilles accepts his sentence, asked to go first so that Poitou and Enwe can see that he didn't die unpunished. This wins uh, the court's favor, and they say that instead of completely being burnt, he's just going to be burned a little bit after he's hanged. 
And uh, also he'll get to choose which church graveyard he wants to be buried in because he's not excommunicated. Uh, since he'd been a marshal, right? This highest military honor, uh, the court grants him three favors, a prayer procession, partial burning, right? So his body can be buried and knowledge of his execution time. This was a very rare occurrence, allowed him to prepare, confess, to receive forgiveness from God. Gilles made his last confession and requested to be buried in the church of the monastery of the Notre Dame de Carmes. Uh, October 26, 1440, they're moving fast. Excuse me, 11 a.m., Gilles de Ray is executed. Thought he was 35 years old when he died. 9 a.m. that day, a prayer procession traveled with him to the gallows. He appeared contrite and pious. He encouraged on way in Poitou to die with bravery and think of salvation. Think of your salvation, perfect battle. Do not cry. Uh, the crowd cried and prayed for his soul. Again, fucking what? That guy? His final words were a sermon about Christian piety. And regret that his grandfather didn't use stronger disciplinary methods to raise him. He should have told me I'm not supposed to fuck kids to death. Probably should have opened and closed with something to the effect of, sorry about all the kid torture and stuff, but he didn't. 11 a.m., Jill falls from the hangman's platform on the gallows. His neck is broken. He dies instantly. His body is burned like a little bit, but not too much. And is taken down. Uh, Enwe and Poitou are hanged and thoroughly burned after him. I feel like they kind of got off easy, right? What's the point of the fire if they're already dead? Uh, Francois and other accomplices only spend a few months in prison, most likely because they had testified against Gilles. Uh, Prelati, that fucking dark wizard, he sends to life imprisonment in some kind of dungeon, but escapes. And he goes on to grift others outside of France before disappearing from the historical record. Barry. Barry probably held it. Barry was in on his grift the whole time. And now, let's get out of here. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. So, did Gilles really do it? Did he kill all those kids? Before I answer that, time for another sponsor. Today's Time Suck is brought to you again by the law office, Chase, Kemper, and Kroll. Have you ever fallen off your bed and landed on your boner, bent it to a 90-degree angle? Yeah, it still works, but it's like, it's like so fucked up. Please call 1-800-THEY'RE-OUT to get you and join our class action suit. We're going to sue your bed. We're going to sue your floor. We're going to sue your balls for not doing a damn thing to help cushion your fall. We're going to sue that weird lady across the street who hasn't waved back at you even one time, even though she definitely has seen you wave at her at least two times. Like, what the actual fuck? We're going to sue Pornhub for putting dangerous boner thoughts into your head. We're going to sue your parents for making a body with such a fragile boner. And we're going to sue your toilet for no longer being in the right place because now you pee all over the floor. Call 1-800-THEY'RE-OUT to get you. We're going to sue everyone. We're going to get this straightened out. We're going to literally get your dick straightened out. No one, and I mean no one, should have to walk around with a bent boner. God, I think I teared up a little bit now. It's a really heartfelt one. Okay, I think I'm done with that gag now. (laughs) I hope that at least makes one of you laugh at how stupid it is as much as I laughed at the thought of being able to hurt yourself that way. So again, did he do it? Did Gilles de Ray kill all those kids? None of us uh, will ever know for sure, of course. Uh, so it's anyone's guess. And my guess is that he was framed for murders that my dad probably committed. I mean, where the fuck was my dad in the 1430s? In 1440? I have no idea. He's not sane. He won't answer my questions about possibly accessing a time machine and using it to kill kids six centuries ago. He says he's sick of this fucking joke. But is it a joke? Or is he sick of me getting a little closer to the truth every year? Closer to nailing his ass and finally putting him where he belongs in jail. Let's fucking go, Dad Watch. Enough's enough. No, for real now. Uh, My guess is that he did do it. Or at least some of it. Despite how outlandish it all is. Actually, I think he did it mainly because of how outlandish it all is. I mean, throwing that many crazy-ass charges against him just seems so unnecessary. When they could have taken him down for doing, you know, things that were way less sensational. I mean, however, Francis King did level similar charges against Knights Templar a little over a century earlier to take them down. You know, confessions made under torture that they worshipped the demon Baphomet, that they engaged in sodomy and blasphemy, etc. Right? Almost all historians agree that those charges were absolutely baseless, that the whole thing was a way for Francis' royalty to get away with not repaying loans given to the crown from the Templars and to take the Templars' vast stores of gold and land. However, like I mentioned earlier, the charges against the Templars, 
or against Joan of Arc or, or other people burned alive for no good reason pale in comparison to the charges against Gilles de Ray. I cannot find a single historical equivalent of such over-the-top heinous charges, so many of them, and against a war hero and high-ranking nobleman, no less. Why embarrass his entire noble family like that? Could it all be lies? Yeah, of course. But also, they could have thrown all those charges against him because he really was a psychotic, devil-worshipping kid fucker. Maybe he really did turn to the occult in desperation when his fortunes were running low. Maybe he really got manipulated by medieval sorcerers and alchemists and just kept going further and further down that weird rabbit hole. No one's stopping him, you know, because he's too rich, too powerful, still beloved for being a war hero. How many sadistic pedophile serial killers have we covered who, if given almost carte blanche to do whatever they wanted to do to kids, would do pretty much what, you know, Jill may have done. John Wayne Gacy comes to mind immediately. Uh, Robert Kraft, the scorecard killer as well. Right, this dude may have actually been a walking nightmare. So be glad this Halloween that you're not a medieval peasant knocking on a castle door for food because you're starving, only to be taken in, told you'll be taken care of, and then instead uh, given about the worst possible death imaginable. Silver lining to today's tale. Uh, if he was that bad, well, he's been dead now for almost 600 years. Let's move on to today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, Gilles de Ray, born into one of the wealthiest families in all of France. After he became an orphan at the age of around 11, he had one of the largest inheritances of any young nobleman in the country. He had so much money by the time he was an adult that he frequently spent it on large parties, food, decorations, servants, financing massive reenactments of his own prior battle victories. Number two, Gilles did not act alone in his killings. His accomplices were Henri Grier, uh, Etienne Corolla, Poitou, perfect butthole, uh, Du Souillet, or C.A., Eustache Blanchet, and Roger de Brickville, uh, Marquis de Seva and the weird Barry summoning wizard, Francois Prelati. All these men actively participated in the kidnapping, torture, rape, and murder of young children. Only Enwe and Poitou really paid for their crimes, both hanged and burned, the rest just imprisoned briefly. Number three, Gilles began murdering in 1432 after his grandfather's death. Without someone to control his behavior, he seems to have given in to dark fantasies. He had probably had uh, at least since his time in the royal court when he started reading a bunch of crazy books. 1439, after spending most of his fortune, he and Prelati attempted to summon a demon, Barry, uh, who would bring them gold. Baron, this demon, demanded a child sacrifice. Jill learned that he loved torturing and killing children, continued to do it even after his alchemy projects did not work out, and totally killed 140 kids. Uh, they think, at least. Number four, Gilles de Ray, allegedly the inspiration behind Charles Perrault's Bluebeard story. Although he and Bluebeard share very few similarities, actually, historians frequently cite Gilles as the source of the story. And number five, new info. This is so ridiculous. Oddly, after Jill's death, he became an example of Christian penitence in France. A three-day fast would be observed after his execution. And then later, uh, a tradition evolved uh, uh, in Nantes where parents would whip their kids on the anniversary of his death to get them to repent for their sins. And that practice lasted for over a century after Jill's death. What a shitty place and time to be a kid. In honor of a brutal child torturer being hanged to death and burned. On the anniversary of his death every year, we're going to beat the fucking shit out of our kids. Life is so weird. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Gilles Doré, medieval monster or witch hunt victim, has been sucked. Uh, thank you once again to Olivia Lee for her initial research. Thanks to the Space Lizards on Patreon for supporting this show. Ad-free episodes have begun. Thanks to the team here, including Logan Keith, the Art Warlock, for recording and uploading this episode for distribution. Next week, a strange murder mystery. The Chicago Tylenol murders. September 29th, 1982, seven people in the Chicago area died after ingesting Tylenol capsules. Some dickhead had poisoned with potassium cyanide. Investigators quickly determined that the poisoning did not occur accidentally during production, packaging, or shipping. Someone deliberately poisoned the capsules with the intention to kill whoever happened to buy those bottles. It's so scary. The murders caused a nation nationwide panic and a recall of over 31 million bottles. First massive recall in U.S. history like this. The Tylenol murders are now considered an act of domestic terrorism, a term that did not exist at that time. 
The victims included a 12-year-old girl, a flight attendant, two mothers, and three members of the same damn family. October 6, 1982, an extortion letter arrived at the office of McNeil Pharmaceuticals, the manufacturer of Tylenol. The writer promised to stop the killing if the company wired a million dollars to a Chicago bank account that once belonged to the owner of a travel agency. But that letter was soon linked to the husband of a former employee, not the owner of the company. Uh, The same day, a Chicago bar owner called the police to report that one of his regulars told patrons he had cyanide in his home for a project. This was how investigators were uh, introduced to the two major suspects of the Tylenol murder case. But 41 years later, no one has ever been charged with the murders. Next week, we'll cover all the details of September 29th, who the victims were, how they died, how first responders realized that all the victims died from poison Tylenol. We'll also cover the full decades-long investigation, the two main suspects, and all the evidence against them next week on Time Suck. Uh, Right now, let's head over to this week's Time Sucker Updates. Updates. Get your time sucker updates. First update from modern, excuse me, tried to sneak in a glass of water about backfire. First update from modern day prophet sucker, a uh, great meat sack with a great attitude, Curtis Lund, who writes, Oh, master sucker, prophet of Nimrod, Lucifini, Lucifina's pony play partner. I, my mouth wants to try and convert words into French words again. Uh, client of Alan Lafferty's life coaching. Long time sucker, first time writer here. Uh, first off, I want to preface by saying I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And gosh dang, oh my heck, do I look forward to you invading my ear holes each week. And I very much enjoy how we have some differing opinions as it helps me examine myself. The latest Lafferty episode showcased our differences very much. However, how could I in good conscience laugh as you make fun of everything else under the sun, but get upset when it hits close to home? People need to loosen up and not take life too seriously. I fucking love you, Curtis. Feel the same way. Kills me when someone's on board for hundreds of episodes, right? Loving it. And then turn on me when now I, I suddenly make fun of their sacred cow and then have this attitude of like, oh, you've changed. Suddenly you, you, you changed. No, I didn't. No, I'm approaching things the same way. It just became personal suddenly for you. Uh, anyway, Curtis continues. That said, let's get to the real juicy parts of this email and stop with the chit chat. Do I have some news for you? I was listening to this week's episode at work as always, the same job I found your glorious podcast at five years ago and have subsequently listened to the whole catalog finally catching up this August. I work for the Parks Department for my home city, so imagine my surprise in the School of the Prophets Suck when I hear that same city name escape from your lips. That's right, I work for Highland City, Utah Parks Department. That's awesome. Uh, That was also when a deep memory started forcing its way to the surface and I raced to text my dad if the Lafferty's had lived anywhere near us. That's when he dropped the bomb that not only were they near us, but Ron Lafferty had lived in the house next door to my childhood home. As a member of the LDS faith, I was in the same ward congregation as many people who lived there for years and as such had been in the same church congregation as Ron and Diana Lafferty. Wow. They had told my dad about how after the murders, while Ron and Dan were on the run, there was a sign-up sheet passed around in church to stand guard in the church building so that stake president Dick Stowe could have his meetings in safety. One member in particular remembered sitting in the tree outside the building all night with his rifle keeping watch. I can picture it clearly as that is the same church building I grew up attending and is backdoor neighbors to the old Lafferty residence. Holy shit. Anyways, I could go on with more stories like my great uncle being a part of Ted Bundy's Utah trials and being personal friends with the head FBI agent on the toy box killer David Parker Ray case. But this one has gone on long enough. Well, you need to send in some more messages. Uh, Thanks for all the laughs and hours wasted. My wife always gives me a nice eye roll when I pull out random facts from your insane brain. Sorry for my poor writing, but at least I can speak out loud just fine, Mushmouth. So I take that back. Not sorry. Enjoy all the watch lists. You are certainly on yours truly, Curtis Lund. Curtis, yes. Probably on a number of watch lists. Uh, Man, so many connections to so many episodes. That is nuts. I love that the congregation rallied together and <laughs> even put a sniper in the tree. Oh man, now I kind of wish that Ron's story ended with him trying to get into that ward, right? Into that church building, meeting that sniper. Uh, thanks for showcasing how people of very different ideologies can still enjoy one another's perspectives. Hail Nimrod, Curtis. Uh, next, a quick update from a satisfied sucker, Adam Hill, who writes, hey Dan, just want to say fuck you. <laughs> Forgetting the Maserati Bugatti Spaghetti song stuck in my head. For a second straight week, I would rather listen to someone queef Pop Goes the Weasel on repeat for two weeks. 
All joking aside, thank you and the whole Bad Magic crew for all that you do. Super excited for next week's suck. I was raised in a Mormon family. Never heard about the school of the prophets. Three out of five stars would not change a thing. Adam. Adam, did I say satisfied? Maybe I should have said annoyed. Uh, Maserati Bogata Spaghetti. I'll stop. I'll, I'll let anyone listening, including you, Adam, uh, complete that song in your own head. I was hoping that Diddy would get stuck in at least one brain. So thank you, Adam. Uh, it's weirdly very fun to sing. Finally, something to really think about from a thoughtful sack. An OG sucker, Ben Goldstein, who writes, Hello to all of Nimrod's chosen people. I watched Dan's recent stand-up special on YouTube, the one titled Trying to Get Better, but you knew that. I had a question I've been trying to word coherently, and I hope I've managed to do so here. In the special, Dan claimed that all comedy has a victim. I consume lots of stand-up, but I'm neither a professional comic, nor even an amateur. Given I'm not coming from a place of ignorance, I'm not going to debate the claim itself. Seems accurate enough to me. However, I am a student of philosophy who has studied plenty of ethics and even taught some to undergrads. So if we accept the claim that all comedy has a victim, I'm wondering if that means comics have a responsibility to joke ethically. To be clear, this would be a professional ethical obligation. Not one anyone wants to be enforced as a law, Nimrod forbid. I'm not asking Dan to lay down an absolute undebatable truth on the matter. Even though as the leader of my cult, he has every authority to do so. And at his behest, I will kill any who disagree. Drink and bathe in their blood and shit on their corpse. <laughs> While there's some philosophical discussion about hate speech, especially in debates over the limits of freedom, most ethical work on speech tends to focus on honesty, either as a duty or a virtue, at least in my experience. For instance, one philosophical classic is to ask whether it's morally acceptable for a person to lie about the location of someone being hunted by a murderer. I have not personally seen or heard any ethicists discuss, uh, talk about comedy. However, I've heard numerous comedians encourage punching up versus punching down. Not so much as a universal rule that can never be broken, but more of as a general guideline. I try to put in an explanation of the terms here, but figure you've surely got a better grasp on them than I do. Having listened to, I think, all of Dan's stand-up and almost all of Time Suck, I'm a couple months behind, but that's still like 700 plus hours of content, I think he generally follows that guideline. Like in all the true crime episodes, Dan relentlessly mocks the perpetrators of horrific violence while never, in my recollection, talking shit about the victims. I haven't engaged with enough to have my own opinion on this, but I've heard other true crime content creators critiqued for essentially glorifying killers. Gross. Yeah, that is gross. Uh, that was probably, probably needlessly rambly. Whoops, my question for Dan is just whether he's got a take on this sort of thing one way or the other. Maybe I could put it this way. If, as you claim, all comedy has a victim, do comedians have any sort of ethical responsibility to choose their victims carefully? I could make it more complex and pose follow-ups about specifics and limitations, but I trust y'all as curious, reflective people to do that on your own if it feels appropriate. Much love to the whole Bad Magic team and the entire community. Hail Nimrod, Space Lizard, Ben Goldstein. Ben, I always love your messages. You've written in many times over the years. Uh, you know, many messages I haven't shared, but that I've, I've read and thought about. You just seem so genuinely curious, thoughtful, funny, kind, and empathetic. Uh, Hail Nimrod to you to start. Yeah, there are numerous schools of thought in regards to ethics in stand-up. Uh, the one big ethical cardinal sin I, I think uh, nearly all comics agree on is joke thievery. Can you talk about the same thing another comic talks about? Yes. It is nearly impossible now not to do that due to the sheer number of comics working and pumping out a lot of material today added to all of those who have come before them. But to listen to another comic's take on something and then just repeat that, essentially word for word or, you know, or close, uh, that is definitely viewed pretty universally as, you know, very immoral. As far as punching up versus punching down, you know, the jury's divided. Many, if not most comics, do avoid mocking someone or some group already struggling in a way that just adds to their lot, in a way that would make them feel terrible if they heard it. Like, for example, uh, doing a joke that, you know, mocks someone for having an intellectual disability. However, joking about the same topic in a skillful way where the punchline is, you know, so absurd or satirically clever or whatever, that while it does technically mock something very taboo to make fun of, uh, also, you know, makes me laugh in, or makes people laugh in a way of we shouldn't take life so seriously. Uh, that doesn't seem to upset most audience members or other comics. Okay, as an example of that, I was recently doing technically uh, a rape joke to illustrate that to audiences. You know, I did it because I've heard some comics say, and a lot of non-comics say that rape jokes are never funny. But then I told one where the rapist becomes the victim of the joke, where the rapist, in fact, becomes the raped in the midst of trying to rape someone else. And the joke, you know, gets more and more absurd. 
and the audience universally uh, very tense when I've started that joke, almost all laughing very hard by the end. Technically laughing at someone being raped, but because that person is a rapist, there's a sense of justice to the joke. And it gives people a moral pass to feel comfortable laughing at it. I guess what I'm trying to say here is that ethics for comedy, uh, less about hard rules, more about it's all in the delivery. A premise, you know, in the hands of one comic can be seen as a terrible example of punching down in a very tasteless way. But in the hands of another comic, you know, can be a joke many will consider brilliant. Uh, Comedy is so subjective. I've watched comics tell jokes I personally find deplorable but have, you know, witnessed many audience members laugh their asses off at that same joke. Uh, Some comics don't seem to worry about ethics. They seem to follow the rule of if people laugh, it's funny, and that's all that matters. For me, despite having a a dark sense of humor, uh, I actually do think about ethics quite a bit, which might surprise some people. Uh, For me, the goal with a new joke or story when I'm at my best is to share what I truly feel about something, what I truly believe, even if it's a sensitive topic, and my take might upset some people. I like to share it in a way where the primary motivation is not to shock, not to offend, but to A, make you laugh, B, make you more comfortable with taboo subject matter because I think it's healthy, right? Not to shy away from uh, subjects and to to be afraid to talk about them and C, you know, maybe make you think about the topic in a new way. Uh, I do think about a lot more than just getting a laugh. Don't always get it right, but I do try to tell jokes with ethics. Uh, am I being clever or just cruel? Am I upsetting Am I upsetting people needlessly or am I upsetting some people who disagree with me while also letting others who do agree know that they're not alone in their thoughts? Circling back to your actual question, do comedians have any sort of ethical responsibility to choose their victims carefully? I think we do. Not all comics agree, but yes. I think there should be responsibility. I think words are powerful. Words matter. And I think if you are not at least trying to be responsible with your words, you're being lazy at best and needlessly callous and cruel at worst. Uh, And last thing, uh, yeah, fuck other podcasters who glorify heinous killers. I do think that, like you, that that's really gross, but that's just me. I hope my rambling uh, answer made some sense. Uh, Don't be afraid of darkness, meat sacks. We should be able to talk about, also joke about literally anything, but also don't be afraid of kindness. Don't be afraid of empathy. Don't mistake caring for weakness. Don't mistake not wanting to needlessly hurt others with softness. It's easy to be lazy and cruel. That, in my opinion, is weak. And I think it takes strength and thoughtfulness to do the opposite. Hail Nimrod to all you beautiful bastards. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Well, thank you for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast. Scared to death. Time suck each week. Please don't sacrifice anybody to bury the demon. Uh, He will not give you shit. He's a liar. A real 'er ne'er-do-well. Just stay the fuck away from Barry. And keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. I thought about uh, talking more now about having a very bent boner but i'm not gonna do that and and i'm not gonna talk about bon jovi Mm-mm. i'm not gonna sing the maserati spaghetti spaghetti you know song uh no sir uh you know uh i think instead i'll talk about how crazy it would be to have a beauty contest using kids heads <laughs> my god it's gonna stick with me that is crazy dark M- imagine that in the present day imagine walking into your friend's house anyone's house and seeing a bunch of heads just uh, on display on pikes or whatever and then this person's like, you're just in time to help judge the beauty contest. I think if that actually happened to me, I would end up just like frozen in place for a little while. Like it would break my brain for a little bit. I don't know that I would be able to process that amount of horror in, in time to react properly. Like even crazier, what if you and a friend walk into that house? And then when the, when the person in the house is like, you're just in time to help judge the beauty contest without missing a beat, your friend's like, uh, the redhead. Yeah, 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 definitely the redhead. That's when I might just uh, run, you know, out in front of traffic. Not sure I would want to still be on earth anymore if that happened to me. Finally, why do I even think about things like this? Like ever. I'm just going to leave you with that.